Craig Carlisle Regional School Committee. Court. Thank you. I will call the Concord Public School School Committee to order and note that we are being recorded and ask for the roll call, please. Anderson present. Booth present. Out present. Maystad present. Rainey present. Wilson present. And I think Eva will be joining us shortly and uh, be on camera camera soon. Um, we, we may have a point at which we ask uh, certain uh, people in the audience to close out their camera, but it uh, looks like we're all set for the present time. Um, before we get into public comment, uh, I would like us to turn our attention for uh, a minute uh, to our colleague Fatima. Fatima, I think you had uh, some remarks for us tonight. Yes, um, I have a statement that I would like to read. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a difference in the way that I present myself this evening and going forward. I have always said publicly that I am Muslim, but that part of my identity, I, I didn't wear on my sleeve or on my head. Rather. There are many reasons for that. One of those reasons was that I was afraid of bias, of prejudice. I felt that it was my responsibility to protect myself from prejudice. So I lived my life as an incognito Muslim, at least in appearance. Today, I understand that if someone is biased against me, it is not my fault. It is not my responsibility. Today, I found the courage to show up. Many who don't understand why Muslim women wear the headscarf, the hijab, um, it has been perceived as a suppression of freedom. I have never felt as free as I do at this moment. I find it liberating. I answered present to the roll call and I've never been more present than tonight. Veiling myself this evening feels like unveiling. Unveiling one of the layers among many of my identity. I have lived in America for 25 years as an immigrant Muslim woman. I have been raising a family in America for 17 of those years. I have acquired along the way a set of experiences that have forged me, made me who I am today, who I was meant to be. The town of Concord was meant to be my home and I have arrived. I come with the gift of those experiences that I offer to this beautiful community. Discrimination and hate stem in part from fear, fear of the unknown. We are biologically hardwired to fear the unknown, the unfamiliar. That's how we made it so far as a species. We will eradicate this fear by becoming familiar with that which is unknown. There isn't an existential threat when minorities take their seat at the table. On June 11, 2020, this community made me the first Muslim elected official in the history of Concord. I like to call it the vote heard around the world, saying loud and clear that we, are committed together to diversity, equity, and anti-racism. Thank you. Fatima, thank you. I think I speak for the committee. I hope I do. I believe I do when I say thank you. I think it's appropriate that we all sit with your words. Uh, that was not an invitation for a discussion. It was instead a statement and an expression. And uh, I, I thank you for that on behalf of the committee.
Sarah, with that, I'd like to move on to recognitions, if I may. That sounds good. Thank you. This, uh, in some communities, uh, might uh, seem to be an odd juxtaposition, but in Concord and Carlisle, it's not. Uh, the recognition I want to bring forth tonight is to police officer Kevin Jenna. Uh, Kevin was a, a member of the Concord Police Department and uh, a, uh, an essential and, uh, and valuable member of the Concord Middle School uh, faculty or staff, I should say. Uh, an integral part of that community, uh, trusted and beloved by students and teachers alike, and uh, uh, brought uh, uh, in his own way, his diverse experiences into our middle school and enriched the lives of students and teachers. Uh, he's had the good fortune to return to his hometown of Lynn, which was his uh, desire, uh, one of his career goals to serve his original community. And uh, he's advanced uh, and is now doing that. But as he departs, we want to formally recognize the contributions he made to both the public schools and the wider community. So thank you, Kevin. His, uh, his service uh, leaves a big gap, but we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, a, a very sensitive, capable crew of people in our police department. Uh, led by Chief O'Connor, uh, no stranger to people who uh, advocate for human rights and human dignities in this town, as well as safety, of course. Uh, and uh, through Chief O'Connor, we're fortunate to have Tina Mancuso now uh, representing the police department as our school resource officer, covering a lot of territory now because she's at the middle school and the high school and uh, she's wherever she is needed. And to, to know Tina is to know that she uh, is somebody who could rival Kevin in, his, in, her, in her ability, her capacity to listen, to hear, to support kids in, in need and families in need. So uh, we're, I think, uh, more than grateful and fortunate to have, have Tina among us. And returning back to Kevin once again, thank you, Kevin. Sir, I think that's the only recognition we have this evening. Am I correct? I believe so. Okay. So, so I think <coughs> we can move on to the reading of the minutes. So quick interruption. I think we skipped public comments. Oh, forgive me. I'm, I'm very sorry. Glad you're, glad you're watching. We're looking at a lot of things here, uh, Cynthia. I, I do apologize, yeah. Uh, my, my mistake entirely. So, sorry, Sarah. Uh, could we open it up for public comments? We're going to look at the participant list uh, and uh, ask for a, a raised hand so that we can recognize you, please. Aaron Fife. Okay. Aaron, if you'd be good enough to turn on your camera and uh, welcome. Uh, could you state your name and address, please? Thank you very much. My name is Erin Fife, and my address is 174 Hill Street. Um, and I just wanted to ask uh, if there would be time for public questions after Dr. Hunter's um, uh, presentation tonight. So it's uh, not generally the rule because it's a business meeting, um, but uh, if it is uh, uh, very germane to the presentation, um, we will certainly uh, honor that request and request that uh, you be uh, uh, brief in your remarks, uh, given the, the uh, uh, extent of the business we're trying to conduct tonight. But uh, let me make that answer short. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Court, are we clear on which presentation? Yeah. Uh, yes, that would be in reference uh, to uh, in the uh, in the joint meeting the. Uh, items uh, seven, diversity and hiring update. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. That's why she's the vice chair, soon to replace me. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we can move on to the reading of the minutes. I'd like to entertain a motion. 
to accept the minutes from the joint meetings of November 17th, December 1st, December 8th, and December 15th. So moved for both committees. Second for both. Anderson, aye. Discussion? Oh. No. Thanks as always. <laughs> Anderson, okay. aye. Who's aye? Aye. aye? For both. Raise that I for both. Rainy I for region. Sorry. Rainy I for both. Wilson I for region. Thank you. And uh, so we can move on to chairs and liaisons reports. And we have, we're lucky to have tonight our student update. So, um, Court, can we begin with Amy and Linda? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, for those of uh, us new to the meeting and uh, the meeting format. Uh, Amy and Linda represent the uh, high school and uh, bring us a report from the high school uh, and uh, uh, questions or comments or recommendations uh, or concerns they might have uh, for the school committee. Welcome. Hi. So uh, one thing that's happening now is this is something very new uh, with CC Theater is we're going to be doing like a radio play. I don't really know the details of that yet because it's just, I think it's just starting and we have like information meetings on Friday, but um, over the winter, we're going to try to have some kind of a recorded play over the radio. And um, something else that Amy and I wanted to bring up had to do with current events. I'm sure everyone in this meeting is aware of what took place at the US Capitol building. And on a student's perspective, for a lot of us high schoolers, we, I mean, throughout 2020, and I guess now 2021, we faced so many current events that were just really unimaginable. And I guess throughout it all, a lot of us students were just kind of thinking, well, you know, I still have to do school, I still have to do my homework. I remember that night, um, I was texting with some of my friends and they even said, am I expected to do my homework? Because I can't look away from the title. I can't look away from the TV. Um, Amy and I both had a calculus test the next day. So yeah, it was, it's kind of hard to, everything, especially around big things like that. It was a little bit hard to like pry myself away from the news and like start studying for tests or doing other homework. Yeah. And I think um, the next day, Amy and I are lucky that we both take presidency and that's a great <laughs> class. And it's also, it is, you know, the most prevalent class to talk about current events rather than a math class per se. There were some teachers who were trying to initiate conversation, but I think the overall reaction of a lot of students were, was that they weren't really able to process it for themselves. So talking about it in, you know, in class, trying to get an initiated conversation, especially when half the students are on Zoom was kind of a little awkward and, you know, but it was by no means a normal Wednesday. And I think some students just, you know, I don't think everyone's really processed what happened. And um, I just want to bring that up just because I think all of us students have just faced something that's a little out of the ordinary when it comes to current events and who knows of whether or not it's gonna continue happening. So just something on the radar. Did you find the teachers capable of navigating that very difficult space and supporting you? Yeah, I think uh, for the most, most part, I feel like, I think especially because the class I talked about the most in was definitely my presidency class. And that's since that's such like a history and politics class that kind of does fit in very well. So I think in stuff like that, it definitely was, we were able, definitely able to like navigate through it and have a good discussion about it. Yeah, and I will say that my English teacher tried to um, since she is my first class in the morning, she did try to initiate something that says like, if you want to, if we can schedule out some time to talk, because I think typically if it was a normal school year, everyone would come in that morning and they would start talking about it in the hallway saying like, did you see CNN last night? Did you see the Washington Post live stream, whatever it may be. But because, you know, so many kids are just still in their homes, they still need to just process it on their own. And I think it's really difficult to try to get support from it when I don't think like people know how to even process it. Mm -hmm. So it was a lesson not only in current events, but in uh, uh, processing. Probably, yeah. yeah. All right. Other items? No, okay. 
questions, comments for our high school delegates? I just appreciate Amy and Linda for the, the forthrightness that you brought, um, because I think, you know, we, we don't know how, how the students are processing all of this. Um, so that was, was good to hear from your own perspective and the perspective of your friends. Um, it is something we are all processing, but yeah. And I'm looking forward to the radio play. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> good. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, other chairs and liaisons reports. I don't have any. Court. I'm going to fold mine into correspondence. Uh, I think that'll suffice for tonight. Okay. Cynthia, do you have a? Well, <clears throat> uh, we're going to see a similar presentation that the FinCom and Concord saw last Thursday. So I'll we'll let that be, that'll be suffice. And uh, <clears throat> there was a uh, last select board, I didn't catch all of this select board meeting. There was a, a brief conversation about CARES Act um, expenditures uh, by the town of Concord. So those would probably be similar to the presentation we'll see tonight for the school side. So that's it. So anybody else talk about the middle school building project later in the evening. So we won't get into that now. Alexa, Fatima, Eva, no. Okay. We did. We did mention. Uh, we did go over uh, our uh, subcommittee uh, for policy, um, and our next one is scheduled for January twenty. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to? you want to yeah. pull in your if, your report? Yeah, if it's okay for correspondence. Uh, uh, I'll represent the Concord Public Schools and uh, say that uh, 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 Concord and the region received a letter from uh, a community group, Concord Organized Against Racism, in regard to uh, a, an appeal to uh, consider. Uh, some of their objectives, which might well overlap with those of the schools in next year's budget. Uh, we, and so that'll be part of budget conversations, very public, of course. Uh, we received a correspondence from a community member representing Safe Routes to School. This is a walking and biking advocacy group that works with the State Department of Transportation. Uh, they're in closer touch with Dr. Hunter than they are with us, but uh, we're uh, kept informed there. Uh, I represented the Concord Schools in uh, two conversations with members of the FinCom and uh, uh, clarified the uh, contract negotiation schedule uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the FinCom. Uh, what we know about the calendar for negotiations coming up. And uh, we received a letter in regard to uh, um, student and teacher COVID testing and uh, uh, ideas about how that might uh, get more attention. And we're getting into that again tonight. And more recently, a, a letter that uh, was certainly appropriately addressed to us, but because it regards the new middle school building project should also be addressed to the town's middle school committee, um, the school building committee, because it is a town project, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it is a school. And this was in regard to uh, electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, and I think that was it on my side. And I think you had uh, at least one region, if I'm correct. I had one one regional correspondence and it was a reporter um, from Patch who was inquiring about how the school was addressing the events of last week. And uh, she was referred to Kristen, who had a very nice interview with her. Thank you. Um, and that is um, on the web if anyone wants to see it. I think, Laurie, you've, you've posted the 
uh, the link as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. I've shared it in a few spots. I could be more thorough about it, I'm sure, but you've seen it. And that was, and that was it for correspondence. It was a quiet, I mean, on that front, it was a quiet week. Um, so I think then we can move on to the to the diversity and hiring update. If that's Sarah, 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 could I just give the update on um, uh, Concord Carlisle Adult Education Advisory Committee meeting? Yeah. Sorry, had some difficulty logging in here. Um, just um, uh, the uh, upcoming meeting will be uh, February uh, 15 on Friday at 11 um, for the um, Concord Carlisle um, Advisory Committee on uh, Adult Education. Uh, last meeting, um, during the last meeting, um, the budget looks great. Um, uh, there is a, a healthy participation in uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, offerings through, through the Zoom. Uh, the committee is working on um, bringing additional cooperation with other uh, committee uh, communities um, and expanding the offerings um, uh, being able to run classes that may uh, classes or programs that may not have filled out um, uh, didn't have enough participation and now they can run that um, uh, let's see what else um, do we have and uh, they are working on uh, the upcoming um, ideas of on topics for can we talk uh, the bulletin with offerings uh, it's in the mail so lots of great classes and programs uh, to take advantage of over the winter and that's it thank you so much thank you yeah, yeah, just quickly acknowledge one of the programs at the um, Adult uh, and Continuing Education, Concord Carlisle, uh, they are offering amongst their uh, programs a, um, in the speaker series, they are offering um, a, a part on um, mystic poetry. And I, I, that's something that I'm very interested in is also drawing the connection with, with the intellectual history of, of our town. Uh, so this uh, speaker series they call um, Lovers, Mystics and Madmen. Uh, it's going to be on Wednesday evenings and I'm super excited to uh, attend. Thank you. Okay, so with, with that, I think we are going to ask you, Dr. Hunter, to lead. I know that you have uh, brought several people our way. Thank you very much. I know you'll introduce them, so uh, I won't try to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. So we are continuing, I guess, what's turning into a series of uh, sessions with you on our cultural competency and anti-racism work. Um, tonight's theme is hiring and diversity and our goals of, you know, really trying to, to hire staff of diverse backgrounds. Um, and it really is about hiring and retaining. Um, it's not a one step process by any means. So this is part of the bigger picture, just to remember there's context to each of these sessions that it's part of, it's a leg in the big picture, not the big picture in and of itself. So you've heard from the um, kids and staff on many of the groups that have formed and the work going on there. Uh, we're going to bring you more on professional development and you had a very extensive curriculum presentation. So this is this is one spoke. Um, Andrew is back to talk with you along with Kristen and our consultant Paula Martin. So I'm going to turn it over to them and they're going to give you updates on learnings to date, work to date, and some of our next steps. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lori. Um, just let me ask, am I sharing my screen to show the presentation? And if so, can I be made host? Make sure you have screen share. Yep, she should be able to share her screen. <clears throat> Thank you. Not yet. There we go. There you go. 
All right, so welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Herbert, the Director of Teaching and Learning, joined by Andrew Numici, our Director of METCO, and Dr. Paula Martin, our Cultural Competency uh, Expert and Outside Consultant. Um, and as Lori said, this is uh, the fourth, I think, uh, presentation to you about our cultural competency work. And today we're focusing on hiring, mentoring, and retaining educators of color. So um, as you know, we come to this work with a shared understanding created by our district-wide cultural competency committee. We strive to be a more culturally competent community. We support our diversity of race, gender, religion, national origin, gender identity, color, ancestry, sexual orientation, and ability. By our choices and actions, we promote all members to feel recognized, respected, and valued. We have set our intention to be responsive, proactive, and empathetic to all facets of culture and diversity. The goal of continuously developing our cultural competency is that it will enable our students to develop the values, skills, and behaviors needed to effectively interact in a culturally diverse community, both locally and globally. So as you know, we have a strategic plan with four pillars. The third pillar is to create a more inclusive culture and um, make sure that our schools and community value diversity and recognize the uh, unique contributions of each learner. Under that strategic initiative, we have five pillars. Um, as Lori said, we've talked to you about the mission statement in August. Um, and we will come back in February to talk about 3.2, which is the professional development we uh, give for our staff. 3.3 is uh, looking at culturally uh, responsive curriculum, which we did an update um, in December. And um, back in um, November, we talked about all of our ways that we've engaged with students and families, and in fact, the uh, whole community. So we're looking for that. Uh, so today is just about hiring. Andrew. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, so why is this work of hiring and retaining educators of color important? We know what the research says that all students uh, benefit from having teachers of color in their classroom. And that's especially true for students of color. Leah Schaefer uh, from the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education uh, says, one of the most, uh, most powerful supports a school can give a student of color is a teacher of color. Understanding the experiences of teachers of color is crucial. Retaining these educators from one year to the next requires superintendents and principals to be intentionally inclusive, to hold high expectations for all staff, to provide excellent uh, training and support, and to actively appreciate the extra mentoring and support uh, work that teachers of color often do. I know at numerous points along my elementary and secondary path, uh, when I had a teacher of color, I felt safe, uh, I felt respected, and I felt like I belonged. Uh, now, as an adult, uh, this, you know, in this profession where the majority of my colleagues do not look like me, I know that ultimately teachers of color must be re uh, represented, respected as professionals, and more importantly, as people. David, uh, um, uh, Davis uh, Dixon of the Brookings Institute, a nonprofit uh, public policy organization in Washington, D.C., says, if we really want to diversify the workforce, the attention we pay to school climate can be for the students. The school climate in which we recruit and retain teachers of color has to be strong and positive as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, something's happening. Hold on one sec, sorry about that. Yeah. Additionally, uh, for most schools, recruiting and retaining uh, teachers of color, here we go. Additionally, uh, for, more, for, for most schools, recruiting and retaining teachers of color is the epitome of struggle. 
That's largely because of barriers such as school culture keep talented prospective teachers of color out of the classroom and push them out of the profession. Teachers of color often leave their schools because of three main reasons, relationships with their supervisors, how they are treated by so-called colleagues or the working conditions. But if the schools and the districts aren't looking at these types of patterns and understanding them, then it's willful negligence on their part, which further uh, perpetuates a problem uh, and will impact a teacher of color's desire to stay in this profession. In other words, increasing teacher diversity isn't just about successfully hiring more teachers of color, it's about keeping them too. Uh, this quote is from Sharif El Miki, founder and chief executive officer of the Center for Black Educator Development. So beyond hiring, uh, we spent our last presentation on cultural competency and anti-racist uh, education in our curriculum. Uh, we talked about um, mirrors and windows how teachers are being proactive in ensuring that their students of color are reflected in their curriculum. Uh, very similar to hiring educators of color, uh, when students have teachers of color who reflect the world they want to be part of, we know they do better. White students typically have mirrors in front of them, lead in the classroom. And especially when teachers and the overall school environment is predominantly white, that reinforces their identity, their goals, and their aspirations. For students of color, on the other hand, often uh, they don't have these mirrors, they have windows. For black students, having even one black teacher can make a huge difference. Um, you know, for me personally, um, you know, when I look back in, in sort of my education, the first educator that I believe looked like me uh, wasn't until I reached my undergraduate studies at Westfield State University. So just to put, put that in, in, the, in, in, in a larger perspective here, you know, I went through elementary school, middle school, high school, not a single teacher of color um, in, in those years. And so, you know, it wasn't until, you know, my undergrad studies uh, that I was exposed uh, to other educators of color. Lastly, I want to share with you, you know, on a national level that, you know, 53% of students um, are uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, BIPOC, yet 80% of teachers are white and 40% of all public schools don't have a single teacher of color. So that's the quantitative data from nationally. And now looking at the quantitative data from Concord, um, the number of students who identify as people of color in Concord right now uh, at CPS is just over 25%. Uh, interestingly, when I ran this data maybe five years ago, it was about 16%. So it's, uh, we have grown, we've diversified in that time. Um, and at the high school, it's uh, almost 23%. Um, so what we want in a faculty is a faculty that's at least more reflective of our student body. So you would want those percentages to match. But right now um, at uh, Concord Public Schools, we have just under 10% of our faculty um, who identify as uh, people of color and at the high school, just over 3%. Um, support staff, meaning tutors and student supervisors and so forth, uh, just under 10% at, um, at the Concord Public Schools and uh, just over 11% at the region. So that's the quantitative data. And then we went forth to try to get some qualitative data. And that is, um, we had a focus group um, and we met a couple of times. We invited um, all the teachers of color who uh, have been new with us within the last five years. And we talked about onboarding, what it was like to be hired, the hiring process, uh, working with supervisors here in Concord. Um, the school cultures, their relationships with colleagues, and what the mentoring uh, situation was. Paula? Hi, 
Are you there, Paula? I am. Okay. <laughs> Unmuted, which I think is a good thing. Um, I, our focus groups, um, we chose that as the instrument. Uh, participants, all participants who were new teachers of color in the district uh, were invited. 10 participants agreed to be a part of the focus group. Uh, the participants were well represented across all levels, elementary, middle, and high school, um, which was important because it allows us to have some kind of generalizability in terms of looking at the themes that emerged. Uh, data was gathered from the participants in their own words and was also organized uh, and filtered by theme. Full anonymity for participants uh, was provided. Uh, if you see any pictures, those are stock pictures. We had um, several themes, four to five themes that emerged um, under each category. So under the, the, the data on onboard processing, uh, two themes emerged. Uh, one was uh, teachers chose Concord because it has a reputation as a very good school system. And the second uh, theme that emerged was uh, Concord had a very good formal processing process for interviewing, hiring, and orientating new staff. Uh, some of the quotes, um, I came from a similar district. Concord is well known as a good school district, top of the line. Uh, a second quote, uh, I changed school districts because I wanted a bright future, both personally and financially. Um, Another participant said, I love the students I encountered in the sample lesson. Um, and finally, and, and not finally, we had many, many more quotes. The last quote here is the hiring and orientation were very smooth, warm and professional. I loved the bus tour of the community. Thank you, Paula. Uh, data from uh, the relationship um, on the topic of uh, relationship with supervisors, uh, one theme emerged, and that is that um, administrators are ve uh, very uh, welcoming and supportive. Um, some of our um, focus group participants said, and I quote, uh, Dr. Hunter was clear and direct that Concord does have racism and we are working hard to end it. She told me it wouldn't be easy as a teacher of color. My principal is very helpful. He is always asking, uh, what can I do to help you? My evaluator is very supportive. I find I have to do less code switching with him. He is authentic about the challenges that Concord faces. Proof of the support is the Cultural Competency Committee and even this focus group. Another um, question we asked uh, the participants was about school culture. And there were four themes that emerged uh, from the dialogue. Um, representation of students and faculty of color is very important. Um, we need to feel safe in this environment and feel safe to have hard conversations. Another theme was some colleagues need more training on cultural competency and anti-racist practices. Um, and the last theme here is the more faculty of color can be hired, the better the envi environment will be for all of us. Uh, two quotes. Uh, one, I love the multicultural meals, the Celtics playbook, the flags, all of it. There were even students of color in the opening day video about COVID safety precautions. And the second quote here is, it is important to create an environment where we can feel safe to speak up. 
say our, our ideas. We need to feel relaxed in our environment. Andrew? So three themes emerged on the topic of working relationships with colleagues. Uh, number one, uh, when introducing new faculty, when they are people of color, the fact that they are highly qualified needs to be emphasized. New faculty must be encouraged to fully participate and not feel discouraged because they have not reached professional status. More professional development is needed to encourage uh, colleagues to be open to self-reflection and change. Uh, two quotes from uh, members of the focus group. One, I feel that diversity is great, but I need to feel that I belong. When we bring up changes, there needs to be positive discourse about it in a safe way for everyone involved. Three themes emerged um, for the topic on mentoring. The formal mentors and mentoring program is very uh, helpful and supportive. It is helpful to have a mentor who works in the same building. When you are an educator of color, it is helpful to find an informal mentor who is a person of color. Three quotes from our uh, participants. She is my mentor for life. We are two peas in a pod. My mentor works with all the new elementary Spanish teachers. She is terrific, but it was hard to make friends in the building. Only now do I feel like I have friends and a professional home. I have an informal mentor who is a person of color that has made all the difference. So those are all the quotes uh, from our qualitative data. Moving forward, um, we have met with our admin team. This group of um, folks working on the diversity initiatives has met, the pre-K to 12 cultural competency committee has met, and uh, we have plans to do more meetings with um, groups inside the school of adults um, to work on this um, issue. Um, and so I categorized our work in kind of five areas. One is um, we have a district level hiring committee. Uh, Paula and Andrew are on it with me and Yolanda Volpe, who's in charge of mentoring and, and um, a few other people. Um, and we're looking out, uh, we got a lot of training for ourselves about how you hire well um, for if a more diverse workforce. Um, and two things that we learned is we have to get our job postings out very early um, so that we can cast a wider net. Um, and then we have to cast our, our net in the right places. So we've joined the professional organizations that you see on the screen there um, who um, are looking for uh, educators of color uh, to join us. So we're trying to get out early and in the right places um, and so far so good. We've had a lot of good luck in the last three years, four years, um, and we hope that that will continue. Uh, and then on the interview committees themselves, with some things that the uh, new folks uh, told us um, that it really, really helped to have educators of color right on the committee um, and that we provide all the committees um, training on um, what it means to be highly qualified and how do we hire um, and acknowledge our own biases? Because um, when we are looking for someone to hire, there are biases towards hiring someone that is more like ourselves. And when most of our educators are um, would identify as white, uh, then you would hire more white people. So we're really actively looking at what are those biases um, as we do the interviewing. And then we look at, okay, so we go through the formal process that's worked pretty well. Um, how do we best mentor and support them? Um, so we've already in the past uh, two years provided training for all of our seasoned uh, mentors on um, particular topics that might come up with uh, new uh, faculty who identify as people of color. Um, we are looking to, when it's appropriate, 
uh, match uh, more faculty of color with mentors of color. Um, and as we grow our staff um, in terms of having more um, educators of color, we're able to do that more and more. And then um, some support groups um, and activities like the focus group. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that those educators said they were so grateful just to have the opportunity to come together across all the different uh, five different schools and uh, talk with each other uh, and find the similarities and differences in their experiences. Um, so um, we will have faculty discussions, as I mentioned, both um, on hiring committees at leadership teams and then full faculty about what we're looking for. Um, and then I think the last piece is kind of covered up by the uh, little pictures on the screen, uh, but it's what we're gonna report on in February uh, about professional development in cultural competency and in working um, with a more diverse uh, workforce in general. Thank you, Kristen. Um, lastly, you know, I, I, I wanna share just, just a few words with you before we close out. Um, you know, if you look at the national sort of landscape uh, on this work of hiring and retaining um, teachers of color, we know that, you know, for, for you know, quite some time, for a long time, um, there have been, you know, many school districts and, and, and district leaders who have, um, who continue to um, really work towards um, uh, diversifying their, their teaching uh, uh, force. And, you know, I think it's, it's best that we also acknowledge that, you know, we, you know, when, when, when we have school districts and, and, and perhaps school leaders um, say things like, you know, I don't see color, for example, um, just that statement alone um, ultimately erases the experiences of educators of color and the experiences that they may, uh, they may have in their school districts. Um, I know that we cannot, you know, address diversity. We cannot address equity. We cannot address inclusion. And we certainly cannot address retention issues if we don't talk about race, um, power, class, and privilege, uh, just to name a few. Um, our focus group uh, really sought out to, you know, sought to understand uh, what our own teachers of color are experiencing in our district. Um, our qualitative data um, and themes that emerge from our focus group that you have heard tonight, um, you know, shows the impact um, that, you know, the relationships that our teachers of color have with their supervisors, with their colleagues, um, and, and of course, through their mentorship, um, really impacts them and, 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 and impacts their desire uh, to remain in our district. And so, you know, I really, you know, I, I leave you with this quote, uh, again, from Sharif El-Miki, who is the founder and chief executive officer um, of the Center for Black Educator Development. Uh, she says, we must be intentional about listening to teachers of color and make engaging with them an ongoing practice if we are serious about retaining them. That means cultivating a culture that will make teachers of color want to stay. An environment where they are happy and thriving, feel respected, valued, and have leadership roles in their schools and districts. One that affirms them, creates a support system, and invests in them both inside and outside of the classroom. So with that said, I wanna thank the school committee, uh, members of the school committee, um, Dr. Hunter for giving us the, the time and space uh, to present uh, to you some of the, the work we are doing in our district around um, hiring and retention of uh, teachers of color. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your time with us and for, for everything that you're doing. I. Um, I mean, definitely, I think in all of the presentations that we've heard and everything and the quotes that we've seen and the voices we've heard of the students, um, definitely, I think we are all very cognizant of the importance of having uh, mirrors in the classroom. I mean, we, we've seen the words of our students of, of how isolated they can feel at times um, for, and, and how that impacts their feeling of safety in the school. Um, and that is... It is, it is of the utmost importance, I think, to all of us. 
I have a few questions. Um, so I, I don't know. I think I might start with doc, Dr. Martin. Can you speak just on trends overall? Um, how you see, um, it, you know, as this as our net gets cast wider and we know more where to to seek out um, educators. Um, are you also seeing increases in? I mean, are are those places? Are they? I guess. Are enough people going to those places to say I am an available educator? Or are the numbers of um, of potential educators in our area increasing? I think is um, what I what I hear you asking me is the the organizations that we we listed in terms of resources. Do we see um, uh, applicants coming through those organizations? Is that yeah, more like I mean, I guess I'm curious overall in the trends in in Concord. I, I see I see what we have from 16 to 25 percent for mm -hmm. our population. I don't know enough about the history of the the district to see what kind of growth we've had um, amongst the the faculty on that. I see that we're you know we're at the the nine eleven percent and depending on on where you're talking about, but where are we now compared to where we were five years ago or or in that time period? And um, and um, are are we able to retain, like are, are we succeeding at the retaining? Um, and are we making ourselves available um, to a wider, to, to, to a larger number of potential applicants? Yes, yes, I am going to, it's a two part question. I'm going to uh, pass the baton to uh, Kristen who can speak to five years ago. Um, however, when I look at what's called NAPSI and NIMNET and Handshake, these are all international and national organizations that attract um, applicants of color uh, BIPOC and beyond um, who are interested in becoming educators to and, and teaching. Um, I believe um, one of the one of the statements made was that um, when you see school districts being intentional about um, their cultural proficiency and anti-racist and they're naming it and saying it, it invites more applicants to consider that district. Um, as one said, uh, Dr. Hunter, you know, really talked about Concord, and the issues weren't um, swept under the under under the uh, carpet, if you will, um, and that makes a difference. I think uh, also teachers of color are looking to go to school districts that not only are authentic and intentional in their anti-racist education and their cultural proficiency, also growth potential. Um, is the school system using top-notch uh, equipment, top-notch books, literature, um, professional development? Is there opportunity to, to grow in my practice? Um, you know, you can, you, every teacher comes in, you know, brand new and, and comes in with skill sets, but you, in order to really to become a, um, an educator of mm -hmm. excellence, that requires also some professional development. So when a applicant goes on a website and looks at all the offerings, again, that attracts more, um, applicants of color to come into the district to say, this might be a district that um, will welcome me, that knows who I am, that sees me, and um, I can grow. And also I can connect with students of color that are there. And then I have a question about the, the, the respondent who said, oh, my, um, my supervisor, I don't remember, my supervisor is, is Great. I, I don't find myself code switching so much, you know, around that person. 
I mean, to what extent is some, that, that to me is kind of a flag to, to say, I don't have to code switch so much, right? Rather than, you know, is that, is, is hearing that kind of language from, from people who are in the district, do, for, if applicants hear that, do they say, oh, maybe, you know, I prefer to be somewhere where I don't have to, you know, where I'm not code switching or where I, you know. Well, that would be lovely, but I, I, as a person of color, code switching is part of your, you might say DNA. It is, it is how one learns to exist in this culture and society. And for one of the uh, educators to say, I can be my authentic self um, most of the time, that's a statement, that's a positive that's statement. Positive statement. Okay. That's a positive statement rather than um, when I come to school, I'm a totally different person than you see when I go home. This particular applicant, you know, is saying, you know, if pre-COVID, if you saw me in Starbucks, I would probably have the same um, personality conversation that I do in school. And that's a positive piece. That's a real positive piece. Sarah, just to answer your question directly about uh, our history of hiring within the school districts, uh, the way I can make a great headline out of it is that in the last five years, we've doubled or tripled or even quadrupled the number of faculty of color that we have. Uh, the actual fact is that we were pretty low numbers to start with. So, you know, the high school had two or three people who identified as people of color. So tripling that is just getting to nine people, um, which is definitely better uh, and we're doing great. Um, and my hope is that as we are able to hire and retain uh, faculty of color that draws more faculty of color. Um, one thing that hasn't come up yet today is that not all faculty of color identify with each other. So it makes a difference if you're black or you're Indian or uh, American Indian or um, so, and that makes a difference to students as well. I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, I'm a, a black boy and I had an Indian teacher. Uh, it's quite another to say I had a role model who was a, a black male teacher. So, you know, there, there are differences uh, within, within that sort of general category of people of color. But overall, we're doing really, really well. Um, and um, I would say our, our new faculty of color and our faculty of color who uh, have been with us for decades uh, are very supportive of this initiative. And we literally couldn't do it without them. And it sounds like on the retention front, um, we are successful in, I mean, it, it definitely I, from everything that Dr. Martin has made me feel much better about, you know, that, that, uh, that yeah. the school is, the, the school is having the honest conversations that it, that it should be having and, um, and, and, and helping make people understand, like, feel their, their value in our yes. community, yes. right? Okay. Um, I have a question, just piggybacking that. Do we have teachers of color in every building? Yes. Great, thank you. Court? Okay. Uh, I'd like to recognize and echo the word that seemed to be uh, repeated a few times tonight, and that was intention and intentional and intentionality. Uh, th this, this conscious effort uh, is, is so critical. The fact that you're coming before us routinely, that we're coming before you routinely, that you've got the groups underway, uh, I think is, is such a strong impression, uh, such a strong uh, indicator that this is genuinely important to us. Um, I, I would uh, want us to remember as a district that although we're making strides with our hiring and our retention, we do have a community uh, that is changing rapidly. And if we're looking for mirrors, uh, we've, got to, we've got to ask uh, who's in the mirror uh, because that mirror uh, 
is, is a community that's undergoing change. Um, I think implied in the data that you uh, presented, Kristen, uh, maybe more than implied, uh, is the idea that uh, we can and should close that gap between uh, percentage of students who identify as uh, students of color and uh, faculty and staff who identify as color. Uh, inherent in that gap is that's the place where we're trying to show change. Um, a question, uh, I'm curious about the potential of student teacher hosting in Concord and Concord Carlisle. I can imagine ways that would benefit us, but ways it would be problematic. Um, do we, uh, do we get visible to a wider uh, uh, group of candidates that could bring us uh, uh, the kind of uh, breadth and, ex and experience and diversity we want if we were to pay more attention to our, our responsibility as a, uh, a, a learning site for student teachers? Yeah, we certainly- I'm not advocating it, I just don't know. We, we have relationships with um, a, a number of local uh, organizations. Probably the one that's best represented in our student teachers is Leslie University. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have a lot of guidance counselor interns, psychology interns and so forth. Um, and those institutions are doing what the school institutions are trying to do as well, which is encouraging more people of color to go into those fields. So even though we have great relationships with all those schools, they don't have candidates of color um, to always offer us. We've had some, um, but far fewer than what we would hope. And it's certainly a pipeline. It absolutely, yeah, you're right about that. Thank you. Can I jump in with a quick comment and a couple of questions? Please. Um, so first my comment is gratitude, both on behalf of the, the school committee and district, but also personally. And I say that because I have seen the progress in, in hiring over the past several years and it's been very exciting. And then on a personal front in the past year, I think this year and last year, um, I had teacher conferences with a couple of the teachers of color. And I walked away thinking, please, please tell me that we as a district are doing a good job to retain these people. And it wasn't just because they're a teacher of color, which I think has value, but because they were just a great teacher. And, and I walked away saying, I want to do everything that I can to support this teacher because I want this teacher for my next youngest child and, and I want them to continue to be here. So that's the, the statement of gratitude again, not just on behalf of the district, but personally, I mean, we have some amazing teachers out there who are also teachers of color and, and both of those have value. So, and that's to the point that you mentioned, one of you, whether it's Kristen or someone about um, <laughs> highlighting qualified, you know, highly qualified, because we're not just bringing people on only because they're a person of color, but they are highly qualified and, in my opinion, amazing teachers, the, the ones who I've interacted, so the few who I've interacted with. Um, so following up on that, I had two questions in terms of the retention piece. Um, one is, you mentioned support groups like this focus group, and I'm very curious, are there ones, this, I know this is kind of a finite project of the focus groups to do some research here. Are we continuing a type of, you know, a district-wide support group somehow for teachers of color? Yeah, so we've had a history of having um, a support group for teachers of color. Uh, as long as I've been here, there's been one. Um, right now, um, there's one specific to the middle school. Um, there's also one um, that any of our faculty of color can go to run by EDCO, by the ideas at EDCO. Mm -hmm. um, so that's always open through our membership with EDCO. So. Um, one thing that has been an obstacle in the past is, you know, we haven't had a lot of faculty of color and coming together physically um, has been tough because all the schools end at different times and so forth or start at different times. So it's hard to physically come together. So it's one of the kind of silver linings of COVID uh, is that we really can meet virtually and what we've found, and I think school committee, you've probably found it too, is that people are more likely to come to a meeting when it's virtual and they can like <laughs> attend on their phone. So we definitely had people in our focus group who were on their phones, but 
it meant so much to them to talk and to listen um, to other faculty of color that, that they were there. That's great. That's terrific. And my second question um, is also a reaction to something in the presentation. One of you read a quote from a teacher or a, a hire um, saying something about, I have finally made some friends in my building and, and, and uh, feel support network there. And I thought, you know, that's very interesting. That's a term making friends that we usually think about for the students and making sure that students make friends. But that's a really important concept for adults, for all of us. If we don't feel like we have friends in our place of work or interaction, it's hard to be there. Um, and so I guess the question is, and I know this is, this is very hard during COVID times because of the fact that social things are like this on a screen. Um, but outside of an actual support group, it, are there, are there things and opportunities that allow for teachers at a particular building to just socialize and make friends very often? So, so, to basically smooth that process for someone new coming in. Yeah, it's one of the signs of a healthy school culture is if the faculty kind of get together on their own willingly, right. you know, outside <laughs> of faculty meetings. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to say that that does happen. You know, I, I, every time I open up like my Willard uh, email listserv and uh, they're doing another Will Willard faculty trivia night or, you know, all of those events that are mostly hosted by the PTG um, and there's some kind of faculty appreciation, but everyone goes and then they hang out together. It, that, is, that is wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. That's all my questions. Hi, could I chime in? Um, Hi, so, um, I, thank you. Thank you, Court. Uh, so a comment and a and, and couple questions. Uh, one comment is that I um, really appreciate the presentation today and um, uh, you, you spoke about mirrors and, and, and windows today for our students of color. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the importance of um, having uh, teachers of color um, for for non-color students, for 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 the general population of our students, as they see um, different perspectives that um, in a classroom, different life experiences, um, and they also see positive um, uh, examples of um, of of people uh, of uh, people of color that may not be living in their uh, in their community. Um, uh, so those experiences. Uh, really are giving opportunity to uh, students uh, to uh, widen their perspective as they are going through the school day, every day. Um, so I really appreciate the discussion and the commitment to um, expanding, um, uh, 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 expanding on this. Um, the, the question, I, I have a couple questions. Um, uh, Court touched a little bit on, the, uh, on my first question uh, in terms of, um, uh, I understand that it's difficult to uh, find uh, teachers of color to recruit them. Uh, is, are there opportunities to uh, recruit through um, not necessarily um, uh, higher teaching positions, but maybe as tutors or um, assistance to coaches, these kind of positions. And the second question is, um, do, are they um, particular locales where, um, teacher, where we are recruiting the teachers of color? Because distance to uh, uh, living, a, a, a reasonable distance to a community uh, that you work in is, is important. We have seen in Carlisle that often, you know, our um, our teachers are not able to because the, the, um, the properties are so expensive. It's, it's hard to uh, find teachers or uh, nurses and people that work in this school or in a town to be able to live in a town. So just wonder um, if you could um, speak further to that. Andrew, can you speak to it? Yeah, you know, I, I was I was as you were uh, talking, Deb. I was thinking about the the initiative that um, the town of Pittsfield out in the Berkshires um, th that uh, they conducted. I believe it was two years ago, where 
um, Pittsfield actually um, received a grant of about, I'd say $40,000 um, from DESE, uh, where they um, proactively went out to um, North Carolina, um, agricultural and, and, and technical uh, state university um, to specifically recruit um, undergraduate students um, who were pursuing a degree in education, right? And they, they um, recruited about 12 um, of those students um, from North Carolina a and um, to come to Pittsfield. Um, and specifically, you know, how, how, how the school district really approached this is, is, is very bold. Um, they, 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 um, they went to the town and, and, and basically asked the town to provide um, some housing uh, for these 12 potential candidates, these, these 12 students. And so they brought these 12 students all the way from, South, from, from North Carolina, all the way up to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, out in the Berkshires. They had all 12 students stay within the town. They had a week's worth of exposure to not only the school system, but of course to the community, um, to students, teachers, et cetera. And the goal of all of that was to orient them um, to, you know, obviously to the school district, but also to give them that exposure that, you know, you know, the exposure where they can see themselves in a school district like Pittsfield, where I believe it was like 90% of their teachers are white. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of this experience, um, they, 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 you know, they gave offers to all 12 of those potential candidates and out of the 12, 11 of those students accepted a position in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Now those positions could have been a teaching position, a tutoring position. Um, however, to have that, you know, to have almost all those candidates say, yes, I, I see myself in Pittsfield. I want to come back. Uh, uh, to Pittsfield uh, to, to start my teaching career uh, says a lot, right? Um, but I think, you know, that was a very bold initiative uh, for not only the school district uh, to tackle, but also for the school district to partner with the town of Pittsfield uh, to ensure that the candidates mm -hmm. that they were bringing up from North Carolina uh, were able to remain um, in the community. And I believe going into their, going into the following year, um, they were provided a year's worth of, of, of housing um, to, again, to, to speak to what you're saying about, you know, the commute and the distance. Uh, they were able to remain in the town for just that one year uh, so that that wasn't a burden. Um, and, you know, that, that, that initiative was actually shared by, um, by um, some folks from DESE in a, in a conference that I went to uh, two years ago. Uh, so I think it's doable. You know, we, we just have to be, you know, really think about how, how creative and bold we want to be with this work. Um, but again, you know, it, it, it shows you, you know, what just, you know, it's not just, but what $40,000 in a grant uh, can really do. I mean, they, again, hired in just one single year, uh, 11 uh, uh, candidates of color, uh, again, to work in their town. So it's, 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 it's definitely doable, but it requires, um, you know, like Court said, uh, us to be intentional <laughs> about about our work. Well, and it also it also tells us that uh, the the town took it on as their problem to solve, their goal to achieve. Correct. And these are pr uh, practical obstacles to uh, uh, people of color uh, to even take on. Uh, to, to, to be able to access those communities with job opportunities. Because if you don't live in a community, it, it, it creates really, a, 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 it becomes impossible to, to commute an hour each way, you know, to, for an internship or for, uh, for such opportunities, uh, short-term opportunities or, so thank you for that input. So is that grant coming up again that we could apply for it? <laughs> Look into that for sure. Um, I know that that was a one-time thing that Desi sort of offered, um, <laughs> but I can certainly, you know, Good idea. <laughs> sure, I'm sure there are grants out there that we can apply for that, that you know, um, that we can use the funds specifically for this type of work. Wow. I think, uh, I think the question about student teachers and I think 
Eva's question about tutors is really a question about our pipeline. And I, I you know, have learned through all these workshops and so forth that Andrew and I have gone to that the key to the pipeline is keeping the pipeline open and wide for a long time. Um, and, and so, you know, in the last couple of years, I would say pro at least three, we have had a lot of ex good experience with, you know, keeping it open as long as we can and as wide as we can um, to attract uh, more faculty of color. And I, I think it's gonna get easier and easier. That's what it feels like every year is that because we now have more uh, faculty of color and they're reaching professional status after three years and so forth that it, every time, every year, it gets easier and easier to attract um, more and so much so that, you know, our the couple of the last hires that we've been able to do came to Concord after they already had professional status somewhere else because we were being so intentional about our hiring. I think the, and, and to add to that, Kristen, in terms of the pi pipeline, uh, teachers who are already here talking about where they work. You know, I'm work. I work in Concord. Oh, how is it? And you know, and 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 all of most educators have friends <laughs> who work other places. And I know I've said, you know, many times, um, someone says, "Do you know if they have any openings for a?" And I said, "You need to go and apply to, because here's a district, you know, not because I'm here, but what I'm here and I see what's happening." And I've said to. Um, friends and colleagues, you need to check out Concord, Concord Carlisle. Uh, this is a, a school system that is intentional about the work, wants to expand their uh, teachers of color, and it's a good, it's a good place to be um, and to grow. So when those, when the casual pipelines stay open, and you know, kind of each one teach one, tell one. Um, that's also another way to to expand the exposure and the invitation. Uh, uh, quickly, do we hold on to uh, possible applications? I know that openings are not necessarily always available. Do, do we hold on to the applicants uh, information even if, um, uh, there is no uh, particular position open at the time? You know, the way that uh, we do a lot of our hiring, uh, not to get into the nitty gritty, but is uh, through a database called School Spring. Um, and so when we say we're involved in all of these other um, networks and so forth, what we're doing on those sites is pointing them to our job applications on School Spring. And so once you once an applicant has set up a um, file on School Spring, they can keep it active, and we can keep we can look back at everyone that we had. So it's a it's a great tool, um, and pretty much everybody uses it now. All educational institutions use School Spring. Thank you. So. Um, I have a quick question, and if it's not a quick answer, I, we're really running way over, and we have people waiting on the call to do some other business. What are we doing new this year that we have not done before? I would say some of those memberships we just initiated last year, that's probably the biggest, most important thing that we're doing. And then keeping uh, the training going for our interview teams. Um, uh, on bias, I think that's another big piece. I would also add, you know, the creation of our um, hiring committee that myself, Kristen, Dr. Martin, and uh, Yolanda Volpe um, sit on to, you know, to again, you know, continue to explore explore these um, this this particular issue on on hiring and retention. Um, we we met a couple of times um, last year. Um, and of course, with this work that, that we just uh, presented to you all, is obviously an ongoing, um, you know, ongoing work um, that we're all engaged in as well. <coughs> and how do potential applicants know about all this work? Yeah. 
Uh, great question. Um, I think, you know, one, one of the way, you know, actually just today I was, um, because we have partnered with these three organizations, we are starting, at least for in my inbox, I'm starting to get hit with a lot of the hiring fairs that are coming up. Um, and so just, just today, um, we have three potential um, hiring fair that um, we, we can, again, um, utilize to, to recruit teachers. Um, we have Howard University um, that, that has a hiring fair in the spring. Um, and, and by the way, all three of these uh, universities are, are hosting virtual um, uh, hiring fairs. You know, we have Howard University, Worcester State University, and UMass Boston. And so I think these, you know, these three universities are potentially three areas where we can recruit that we can prepare some, some, some information uh, for potential uh, candidates uh, to have, to read, and to get to know our district. Um, and so I'm, I'm eager to, to attend these virtual um, uh, career fairs um, and, and, and see, what, you know, see what the candidate pool um, looks like. So. Thank you. I'll be brief since we're running late. Um, so I, I wanted to follow up on the on on the solution of of, of housing, how important it is for um, for one for our teachers, our staff to live in the communities that where, where they work, um, and that is on uh, our town and all of us to have those conversations. And uh, that's an area where I have learned and I have grown um, because. Yes, I do support affordable housing, but I've had conversations with people that are not very supportive, but I, I understand also from those conversations, uh, the concerns and they are real. So it matters how we do it and where we build. Uh, so I got to understand and from, grow from there uh, in terms of uh, that uh, issue. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, what a sea change we've had in our school district in the past five years. Uh, it's, it's been really, really enormous. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, Christine and Andrew and Dr. Hunter. Uh, since you've arrived here, uh, you, you saw it right away, you heard it right away, and you tackled it right away. And uh, that's, that's really enormous. That was a risk. And you took a risk on, on, on minorities, you took a risk on, on uh, anti-racism and it's paying off. And I personally appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. It's, it's a, a scary thing to do sometimes and we absolutely uh, love your support. Couldn't do it without it. Wouldn't do it without it. Uh, Kristen, I'm going to I'm going to use that as a segue, a scary play, you know, the, the, the fear, the vulnerability required to uh, to learn and grow and change. Um, because here's where I think I can uh, credit Aaron Fife as a community member who's created a safe place for members of the community, including not uh, a few educators who have spontaneously joined this uh, group uh, Concord organized against racism. Um, I, I do believe it's a, a safe place for people to learn and grow and confront what they don't understand and uh, gain, gain uh, sensitivity they didn't have before. That's been my experience. Um, so I, I don't want to put uh, too much your way uh, uh, in terms of a buildup, Aaron, uh, because I know that's not why you're here. I think you're here to uh, uh, share insider questions, not to receive my my accolades, but I do want to thank you for the efforts you've made to get the uh, the group together and be as as welcoming uh, as you have been in these efforts. So I'll ask you to unmute and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Court. Um, yeah, we couldn't do it without all of you either. So the community, we're creating a community support for all of your work. And thank you for that. Um, my question, I'll keep it very brief, um, is, you know, I see a lot of these actions that you're listing and a lot of this data. And I was wondering about how uh, we can show this data um, uh, in terms of outcomes and how we can show it to the public. So 
can we see, can we track hiring over time, you know, over the last five years, how has our staff, what, what have the percentages been? Um, I'd also love to drill down into the individual schools, how many staff of color are at each school and how does that track with the population of students at each school? Um, because coming from the Thoreau district, we have a growing number of students of color and not, I have not seen a growing number of staff of color necessarily in that particular school. Um, so that's my question. Great, excellent, thank you. So Kristen will ask you and uh, uh, Andrew and certainly Dr. Hunter and Dr. Martin to hang on to that question and come back to us as I'm sure you will, thank you. Any other any other uh, uh, comments from the school committee? Uh, hearing none, we want to thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Andrew, uh, Dr. Martin. Certainly, thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, let's use our pivot word, our familiar word, uh, this uh, this school year, and pivot over to uh, item B, uh, Dr. Hunter, and that is uh, testing. You're on mute. Thank you. So let me just pull my slides up. Um, there are some folks here to help inform this conversation. So I'll encourage um, Brad Guth and Anna Schneider from CIC Health. And I'm gonna story tell a little, they're the experts. Let's start this conversation with us saying that um, I am not a pro or have all of this figured out. We're here to sort of talk on the state of the options that we've revisited off and on um, and as well as a state option that has come up uh, sponsorship by the Department of Public Health and Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, I've had a couple conversations with CIC Health, so they're here to make this a more informed discussion than I could do on my own. So we'll invite them to chime in at any point. Um, and I'm gonna do a really high level overview of where we're at and what we have for information. And then it is a discussion and um, you know a request for next steps to see if we can try to get something moving. Um, so just updates, a reminder that we are currently, um, thanks to your support, testing symptomatically, symptomatic people uh, in Cambridge. And we've started to test staff at the high school, high school staff so far. We'll keep growing that. That's about a week old. Um, through that same partnership with the organization in Cambridge, um, people are at their own option, able to go in and do in asymptomatic testing. Um, at also at their own cost. So that might be for a close contact. There's been people going in for travel. That's all based out of the Cambridge site. So those are options now when there's a need, we have some testing options that allow for efficient and effective appointments and turnaround. What we're talking about tonight is different than that. We're talking about more broad-based asymptomatic surveillance testing, um, which we talked about earlier in the fall, trying to help us understand uh, what's happening for those without symptoms. Um, and I'll talk more on what I think the information does for us. Um, so last week when we came back and had heard there was COVID funds to be available, and I'll preface that by saying we're still trying to hone in on how much, um, but we heard that. So we started to reach out to vendors. Uh, you know, sometimes things just come together. Brad happened to reach out to me last week and the timing was perfect. So we had pursued that quickly last week to talk about what CIC could do. And then Friday, uh, the governor announced that the state had come to the same conclusion and they were gonna be offering districts options for surveillance testing. We owe them a response by this Friday of our level of interest. And I'll get into some of the, some of the details. We don't know a lot of details, but some, um, with a tentative rollout they're slating for late in January and we're awaiting more information. So what we're talking about is a PCR pool test. So I think you're familiar with the PCR acronym at this point. Uh, the pool test means that it's a pool of 10 nasal swabs all analyzed together, which is meant to help the cost come down. Results are still 24 to 48 hours. 
Um, it seems like Broad is still the lab in the mix, which we're becoming very familiar with. So that's, I think, a positive. Um, if the pool comes up positive, then each person who's in that pool needs to have an individual PCR done. And then you can identify who's the source of the positive test. Um, we do have an option right now because of our previous work that we can run those individual tests um, possibly at the high school if, if we've got the capacity to do that or we can send people into Cambridge. So I feel like that's a benefit for us that we've got an immediate pipeline to the next stage um, and we don't have to figure that out. You know, there are a lot of logistics to all of this. Um, we've been talking with districts that are already doing it. Um, most we are finding they do not assign pools. It's random and based on how people come in to be tested or the tests are returned, depending on which tests they're using. Um, and it's really figuring out the hub of the organizational pieces out of mostly the nurses' offices and just managing scheduling and getting getting tests to to Broad and some of true logistical pieces seem to be um, the bulk of the work. Um, I must get into to cost because it is a big piece of the discussion. Um, so thanks to the state release, they are saying they will pay for the first six weeks of the program. They did not attach a cost going forward past that. So we have more information to gather um, about how that would work transitioning from them. Um, in working with CIC, uh, the approximate cost is about $10 per person per week. Um, so, you know, we just ran very broad numbers here. And this is assuming 100% participation on a voluntary program. So that will not happen and that will already start to bring the numbers down. Um, we have about 720 employees pre-K through post-secondary. Um, so 10 times that is an easy number of 7,200. If we estimate it at 18 weeks and we've bounced around which number to use there, depending how the six weeks falls, and when we get started, um, you can see for staff, it's maximum cost of 130,000. There's a lot of variables to play with there in terms of how are we testing weekly? The state program is twice a week for staff. Um, the vaccine is gonna roll out some in the, somewhere in the middle of this and what is the impact of that? And again, just percentage of participation is a factor we don't know yet. Um, student cost, this, the numbers are the same, just times more, more people. Um, approximately 3,300 kids in the district. And I just did the math to show you. Um, clearly there's a large price tag here as we talk about stat students. Um, some districts aren't testing the elementary kids. Uh, there's variations on all of that, of course, in terms of whether you include everybody, do you focus on the older kids? It will certainly be voluntary. And we, again, don't know its level of interest at this point. Um, so there's, there's a lot to figure out there. Um, in terms of what the options are for costs, and I just wanted to name some, um, we need to understand our current roles and duties and how that's gonna play into the demand of this process. Uh, the work that I've been doing with our lead nurse, Lisa Kosky, has been to just sort of analyze how we're operating and where there's windows and where there aren't. Um, you know, I and we don't know if we can do this within the current staffing. She's feeling probably if everybody's being offered the testing, we need to allocate a half-time nurse to that. I can't answer if we can do that within our current people or not at this point. And it feels like the big load is the administrative piece and perhaps we're going to need to either reallo reallocate or hire um, a support staff just to manage some of the, the logistics. But we're on the really early phase, you know, early discussions of this with uh, only so much information. So I just I don't want to commit to saying we must have this, but I do think we have to expect there could be a little bit of staffing need, just knowing what I know about the demands on the nurses offices right now. Um, Funding options, and we've talked some on this way back in the fall thing. There are various options that we'll just name again. CARES Act is certainly some, and that's what the state's recommending to be tapped. Um, the Concord Education Fund, other districts have um, approached their education funds and created partnerships with them. Some districts have been fundraising um, either through or aside from the education fund or on their own, and some districts are asking parents to pay. So it feels like a nice little window here with the six weeks of cost coverage to get us going, which I'm sure is the state's intent and give us time to figure this part out. 
So um, next steps, and these are just my, my recommendations, certainly all up for discussion. Um, I do think we should determine and commit to our interest in hearing more on the DESI DPH program, which just means I sign us up for hearing more information by Friday. I do think the data as to the level of interest of staff and families would just give us numbers to work with in terms of multipliers of scope and cost. And I don't think it's a, we need a certain threshold to go forward because I think there's value regardless, but I, I do think it would just be helpful for operational purposes. Um, we definitely need to continue to connect with the districts currently testing. We've been doing that the last week. Very, very help, very, very helpful to hear their work and their structures. Um, relationship with CIC, uh, like I said, is very positive. If I need to make a recommendation for additional personnel, we need to keep working on that. And of course, uh, continuing to pay attention to DESI and DPH. So that's really where we are tonight, um, is a discussion of next steps. I was asked earlier today, and it, this might be worth repeating it to everyone, you know, if the state hadn't proposed anything, what would I have said our starting point was? I definitely would have on our own said we'd start with staff and make our way to students. So I just want to say that out loud because maybe it's part of this discussion in terms of how we move forward. Um, so I think that's where I'll wrap it up. I see Brad's turned on his camera. So he, he Brad, I'll let you introduce yourself and anyone else you brought with you that you want to introduce. Um, and we'll let you take the conversation from there. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I I recognize several names here. I, I'm, I've had many of these conversations, but it's, it's for me, it's neat having one in the community where I live. I, I live here in Concord. Uh, so both kids went to uh, CC. Um, and so, you know, enjoyed my discussions with uh, Lori, just thinking about where the town is and where we can go. Um, I have my colleague, Anna Schneider here as well. And um, yeah, a lot, has, a lot has really moved in this space um, from when, when we started in June and July, you know, kind of working with the Broad who had the technology, um, but kind of the challenges of kind of beyond the initial use case of, of, of all the colleges and such, um, how can we make this into something that you could really even conceive as possible for public schools? And uh, the traction that's now been made in terms of now having a viable approach for pooled testing. Um, yes, we want to get the cost down lower. Hopefully we can get down, you know, below $10 a test. Um, but now all of a sudden we have something that is worth, you know, worth thinking about. So um, we're both here to, you know, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot, uh, Anna's done a lot in the schools themselves. Um, and so certainly could talk through some of the questions around what this looks and feels like. Um, you know, we are, you know, DESI is kind of looking at various vendors. Uh, we're certainly, you know, very active in discussions with them. And I, I would expect that we'll have something more to say about that. Um, you know, and our, our role is really, um, you know, to simplify the logistics around standing up programs. Um, in fact, some of you may have seen today, uh, Governor Baker uh, announced kind of the first max, mass vaccination site down at uh, Foxborough, and, and we're the operational partner for that. So, so kind of our skill set is, is really evolved around, um, um, you know, the logistics and the operational expertise, uh, you know, to, you know, tackle this very difficult challenge that we're going through. Thank you for, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, uh, implied in what we're talking about is that uh, this school committee and this, this leadership team has a desire to move ahead on this. Um, and I'm not sure we need to revisit that, but I'm happy to if this committee wants to. Um, implicit in what we're doing tonight is uh, uh, a desire to, to move ahead and expand testing. So I want to, before we go any further, I want to put it to the committee. Is that so? Because I don't think we want to uh, let that go unaddressed if somebody thinks it needs to be addressed. Uh, uh, I'll say as one member of seven, uh, I, I am prepared to move ahead uh, because we're trying to uh, tackle a lot of unknowns uh, within some very known threats. Uh, and I think we're going to have to be proactive and as I've told my own family, uh, in a year, I'll know whether I was uh, uh, overly conservative or not. Right now, I don't know. Uh, uh, nobody's gonna tell me in a year that I got it just right. Um, so I, I wanna put it out uh, clearly to the committee. Uh, are we prepared to move ahead? 
Dr. Hunter's uh, um, done this because she believes we are. And I want that affirmed if that is, if that is the case. I, can I ask a question? I think there are two separate questions. I think, are we prepared to move ahead with the six week program in, from Massachusetts? That's, I think, an easy question. I think less easy is, you know, if we had 100% participation, are we willing to allocate what's really going to be like a quarter of a million dollars to this? If we had 100% particip participation for 18 weeks? I think those are two totally different questions. Well, you, you framed it perfectly, yeah. I, I think we can look at this as a, as a dialing up of our, of our testing program and that definitely this, this the DESI opportunity gives us a chance to really dial up in, in a different way. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Hunter, you mentioned that there, there's, if there's, you know, there's interest in maybe the way that we started the testing program that we have in operation right now with a small group. And so is there a way in the next couple of weeks to sort of pilot this on, on our shoulders um, with, with just the, the faculty in, in some way? And I think something that I'm curious about that also is just the, uh, Brad, you, it, it, I just need a clarification. Is it $100 per, per test tube or is it $10 per person? So can you have yeah. smaller, could you, you know, is, if you do five people, is it, is it $100 or is it $50? Yeah, um, so the current model is by the tube. So in theory, the cost would go up if you were not filling the if you're not filling a tube, correct? So, so Dr. Hunter, do you think it's reasonable that we could think of some way to, to try out? I mean, I guess it's we're already on the 12th, right? And optimistically, this would be starting the 31st at the state level. But let's give a little window there. Would we have a chance to do at least one testing in the faculty? Um, I think so. And, and Brad, please chime in because it would, you know, really in our conversation, you said it would be about a two week turnaround to get started. I, I think the staff is a doable starting place. The scope of doing all the kids and the staff is definitely a little different <laughs> journey. Um, and I, I do that we're being really successful by starting with, you know, a, a manageable quantity with our symptomatic testing. And, you know, that's going to grow fairly quickly, I'm sure, as we, now that we got have our feet under the ground, I think the same would be here. And the staff, of course, you're just dealing with adults, you're dealing with the people who work with us all the time. And, you know, we are able to say, you know, we're, we're just figuring this out. I think um, that's been a really other big part where um, those, is a, those on the real ground floor of the symptomatic piece were able, you know, a couple of us, me included, were able to say, can you just try this? and see how this is going to work because we want to work the bugs out with a small group of people and not thousands or or whatever so that would be my sense is that that's a doable starting point for sure yeah, and, and the fact that you know the, the fact that the pro ems program is already going i mean you have some ex you, ha you have you've already taken the first step right so you have kind of that construct and i think also um, you know, some towns have already moved, so there's also some experience, you know, so we're working with the town of Harvard, um, you know, who, you know, put this out to an RFP, et cetera. They started a week or two ago. Um, and so I think there's a lot, I think, Laura, you've already, you've already, you've already spoken yeah, to your colleagues over there. So. In Harvard, so we've already tapped her firsthand experience sure. here. <laughs> yeah. And we've been talking to Wellesley a lot too, who's doing a different type of test, but correct. And Watertown has so we have a model of Watertown. So, so I mean, so there is some, you know, the approach of taking a, a first step like that makes a lot of sense, you know, to get down the learning curve. Um, but there, there is, there is, you know, there's now experience around in other communities that that can that Concord could definitely draw upon. Yeah. The, the the question we have per week right now assumes no positives, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we would we would incur the cost of the assuming we're going to cover that or however we're figuring this out. Yes, you'd incur the cost of the the pool that needs to get to the individual test. Yes. So the uh, the uh, towns that you're mentioning are these the towns that have um, they are uh, uh, in uh, re remote coming into uh, uh, 
uh, entering, st uh, bringing students back to school or uh, the schools are in the same situations are as us because from what I've heard from um, what I understood from uh, Baker's uh, uh, information that he has put out was the purpose of this program was to really uh, push more schools to come back online, feel safe enough uh, for teachers to feel safe enough to come back online and bring students uh, into the building. The two we've been talking to have been in person all along. I know, you know, Brad mentioned Watertown. I think theirs was more of a return to school plan, but the two we've been talking to have been in person and open, so. Just a little clarification though, Harvard does not test remote students or teachers, fully yeah. remote. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. So mm -hmm. there's a place our numbers are gonna drop a little. We didn't sure. track them off. Great point, Cynthia. But just, um, just my two cents on how it has gone in Harvard since I have been there. We're in our second week and I think we were all a little, well, very nervous about how difficult this would be. And at the end of the day, I think we were thrilled that it was much easier than we thought it would be. Um, the whole data entry portion of it is, is very easy. And, you know, <laughs> honestly, we're a much smaller district, but we really did it with three people. <laughs> so, um, and we finished our testing today at 1030. With half the school, much smaller district, so I, I can't sure. compare, but just. Yep. Now it's great to have your first hand <laughs> eyes on this and feedback. <laughs> so, question for actually for Cynthia Does the testing cut into the, um, the teaching time at the school, we, or is it done after or before? How does this, if you don't mind, because I don't think the public uh, will understand what happens in other know this, this, Right. We did it in during our mass breaks. Hmm. And that's how easy, that's how fast it goes. We have 10, 15 minute mass breaks. And the testing itself is, you know, so fast. So it didn't, you know, it's definitely not a nothing, but I would say it is, did not have a huge impact to teaching and learning. So an, a follow up question, because we have done uh, testing before. Uh, when you go to get tested, you have to blow out your nose, Correct. clear your nose passages. Yep. So the students do that in their in, in their seats? How, how does this work? Because it's not necessarily um, probably the safest thing to have everybody blow out their nose. Uh, to, so we, to do, we have little pop-up tents indoors. outside with, with three and they're sort of, they walk through the tent. So there's a station where they blow their nose, they hand sanitize, and then they walk into the tent and get tested and hand sanitize on their way out. These are all students. Teachers would be much easier. Again, I would, you know, probably outside tents the best, but, you know, CIC probably can recommend, you know, approaches. You had different models. I mean, I don't know, Anna, if you want to share any. Uh, yeah, I think Watertown is doing um, sort of a drive up type of situation. It's a little bit different, but um, as much as possible, a lot of schools are having a, an outside um, area or just a separate part of the building that people feel comfortable that this, you know, scenario is happening. So, Dr. Hunter, if I'm correct, in oh. your conversations with uh, Brad and his his group, uh, you were confident that uh, we could move uh, from the state to his program with with great ease and be seamless. Am I correct? That's my understanding. Brad, you probably have more assuredness of that than I do, but that's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, good. perhaps perhaps it'll be one and the same. I mean, that would be, right. you know, and that, that's, but I just, I, you know, we're not, we're not finalized with, with Desi yet, but uh, I, that would be my, my hope. Okay. Uh, a minor point, uh, stop me if I'm getting into the weeds here. Is it not true that the state uh, program tests twice a week and we're discussing once a week? Am I correct? That is true. They've suggested twice a week for staff. Brad, do you, or Anna, Chris, I see you're here too. Anybody well, have opinions on that for? Well, you know, okay. So um, the good news, you know, we have a lot of experience from, you know, the college has got a head start on this, right? And so the epidemiologists, before they went back to school, 
um, studied all this and said that if your objective is to prevent community spread, the ideal theoretical cadence is once every three days, so twice a week. Um, what and, and many of the schools are doing that. You know, my, my youngest is at Colby, and they're twice a week, um, um, and it's very high tuition. <laughs> um, um, what seems to have converged is that if you are able to test weekly, um, you will not eliminate cases, um, but um, you will um, re significantly reduce the risk of community spread. And so that's why a lot of organizations and schools have converged upon weekly testing. Um, and that's also assuming that you're doing weekly testing with the 24 hour turnaround time that we're talking around with, with the road. You have that in place because you're picking up with the PCR test, you're picking up the viral load when it's quite low. Um, and you know, so now you remove somebody from the system before they're contagious. So, so we've seen many organizations schools that have converged upon weekly testing and and results have been good but we also are very clear in saying we can bring you we're not we're not the medical experts you know right. so we you know it's it's a it's a choice to make you know yes of course twice a week is is better um but um you know if spread is the biggest objective then weekly seems to be something that uh, um schools have been successful with so with with the goal of of prevent of reducing community spread, uh, is there uh, any or what is the discussion about the percentage of participation necessary before significant uh, control uh, is possible? Do we know what's the? Sp I, I know there's no number, but yeah. what what's the dis what's the talk? Uh, Seventy five eighty. Thank you. Seventy five percent. Okay. Um, Dr. Hunter, I have a question. Um, how, how do you see this testing um, help bring students back full time? You know, I think we have to do one thing at a time. Um, I was asked this earlier this week. I think the first piece, we don't know what we don't know. So we don't know if we're transmitting asymptomatically because we have no way to capture that right now. So for me, that's the first piece of data, especially with the surging going on is, are we is there transmission going on that we can't tell because people aren't contag you know, aren't symptomatic? I'd like to know that, first of all. And I think too, it will get us a little step for, we're very comfortable, but I'm not gonna say we're anxiety free right now and how we're operating with the numbers of cases. And you know, we, we were at 32 cases last week alone. So I, I do think this is another level of confidence building I think it's a bigger picture discussion in terms of other things that have to play out. I don't think it's a standalone trigger to anything per se. The vaccine has to play out. A number of other pieces have to, to give us direction on how we're gonna move forward towards bringing everybody back. Um, so I, I don't know that I think this is the immediate because I, I know I have, we have to go to three feet pretty much, certainly 612, we have to go to three feet and at the elementaries, our afternoons are purposely scheduled the way they are to not, not need to figure out how you do these mass things of lunch and recess and specials and, and such. And that's why the core academics are all in the morning. So I don't see it as a one-to-one -one relationship. I think it's an important step um, towards how we will get there. I, I don't know that I see that it's an immediate. So it's part of a, it's a big picture. And, you know, we're going to have this discussion on how we you know, make our way back to um, normal. I think it's gradual is my sense. And we'll certainly want to talk on that as we get into the early, late winter and spring. It's a good, great question though. Great question. Do you, do you see a need for, you know, I, in a utopia, right? Teachers that will be vaccinated by the conclusion of phase two, which ostensibly would be you'd have all, both of your doses by the end of March, right? Um, would you see the need to test teachers once their vaccination program has been completed? What a great question. So I uh, reached out to um, our public health nurse last night and said, you know, once you're vaccinated, what happens in terms of if you're a close contact or whatever? Her answer, and I'll ask the others to weigh in, but her answer was the you know, the, the research on transmission, even though you're vaccinated is still 
a work in progress. Yeah. So she was that's active. That's the right answer. Yeah, <laughs> she, she's yeah. actively listening to the DPH, you know, information that's coming out. Um, I don't think it's a sure thing that you are vaccinated and say you don't need to be tested more because we might want to know you could be transmitting, not because you're going to get sick per se. So it's sounds like it's a work in progress still. I think that even in California, where where people who work in hospitals are vaccinated, they're asking them still to wear masks mm -hmm. in their homes um, yep. because there is still a lot that's unknown. Right. And, you know, the other part of this discussion and Fatima's question, you know, the kids vac the vaccine for the kids is is a ways out here still. So that'll that's going to impact our decision making, in my opinion, for months to come still. I wish I knew how many, but I have no way to know that. Um, I think they're just beginning to test the vaccine on small, small groups. I had a quick question, if I might, about um, the remote students. And if we're not testing the remote students, is that something that we should consider? My question would be how many a percentage of kid, those kids who are remote are doing extracurriculars um, after school, participating in sports, or even participating in extracurriculars that don't have anything to do with school, um, where you could test a pod and then sort of see where it's almost like you could do a contact trace as to where they're um, getting it. At. So, so um, I, I just want, I know there's a lot of talk about sports and the spread through sports. Um, so I was just interested in that piece and what, yeah. the, what everyone thought. Yeah, we'll ask you for a name and address for the record, if you'd be so kind, and then we'll ask for a response. Absolutely. Leah Butler, 533 Lexington Road. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I cares? just want to note that we're deviating from the normal practice, that usually we are having a meeting in the public, not with the public, but but mm -hmm. I think answer, answer the Apologies. question. So I, I don't know, know if we have the answer to that exactly. I'm, oh, sorry, Court, go ahead. I oh, mean, to no, interrupt. please, Dr. Hunter, go ahead. I don't no. think we know the answer to that. I mean, I, you're not wrong. Um, in fact, I've been reporting remote cases because some of those kids come and play sports, and you know there is impact. So I don't know the answer to that per se. I understand why the priority would be to kids coming into the school day likely first. Um, so there's there's a discussion point to be had there. Um, it is. It, and it may depend child to child, depending on their level of some, you know, and we've talked to a lot of these families, there's a range of reasons you're doing it. So it may impact the decision in terms of participation. If we wanted to, uh, I, I like Sarah's reference to dialing up. We're, we aren't hitting off on switches, we're, we're dialing up. Um, uh, if we wanted to move very quickly, we don't know when the state is gonna move. So Brad, would your firm want uh, a, uh, a date certain before we talk to you about engaging you? The, the date certain in terms of the... When, when your firm would come in uh, uh, under, under Concord's uh, relationship with you, not, not the state sure. affiliation. Sure. Um, no, I think we're, I mean, we're pretty mission-based. I mean, I think we're, we're flexible. Um, and so, you know, the way um, that we work is, is it's, you reserve testing for a certain period of time. Um, so I think, you know, the, the first thing I'd wanted to do is to kind of, um, you know, get you capable as soon as possible, um, you know, meaning kind of going through kind of a contracting and training and such, mm -hmm. and then we'll have some more information in terms of the state program, um, our role, et cetera, um, and, uh, you know, and, and could, you know, work a week at a time or whatever it might be. I mean, I think there's a fair amount of flexibility. All right. I'm going to ask Jared uh, through Dr. Hunter, uh, as brief as you can, I apologize, because I like to listen to you. I learn a lot. Does it, uh, are we uh, within purchasing prerogatives to uh, move without uh, any any extensive uh, RFP uh, purchase or uh, RFP process? How fast yeah. can, how fast can you move? Uh, if approved right away, this is exempt. Thank you. <laughs> Doesn't get faster than that, Court. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hunter, 
Hunter, are we able to use that vaccination tent for testing? Because Cynthia I, has mentioned, yes. Yeah, and, and that was actually part of the discussion that we had um, in the early in the early talks of the um, setting outside going up. So I believe the town would be very open to that during the school day. But just or to really be any time they're not vaccinating, yeah. But just to be clear, you really need very little infrastructure. You don't right. need power, right. you know, Wi-Fi or anything like. You just need the testers, and all the data entry can occur. Yeah, outside of that setting. Good. I'm sorry to keep extending this. I have one quick question for Anna or anyone who has kind of experience and insight into other towns who are doing it. Um, I'm imagining, in terms of this pool and then the follow-up tests, um, I imagine this being not a a, a big deal. And of you know chaos and confusion and everything after a positive pool test because we have testing on site in Cambridge Access. So I'm envisioning this, and this is from a perspective of you know a parent who might be thinking, oh, do I want to participate or not? And this would help us communicate this out. As a parent of three kids, you know, who's thinking, oh, my three kids might be in the same pool, might be in a separate one. Um, my vision is that it even if there are some positive pool tests it's not that big a deal because those kids can then be tested relatively quickly and maybe they miss out on a day of in-person school, but then they're back into the flow. Is, is that how it's playing out in other places? Yep. Yeah, basically. I mean, I think you do want to plan for that approximately 24 hours of needing to retest or re-swab right. um, and then plus the result coming um, after that. So, you, right. you, you know, depending on how quickly you can get that test out, um, yeah, that's going to impact that time that someone's out of out of in-person learning. Um, right. That being said, it sounds like you all have a system that's that's set up nicely. And um, I believe, you know, from the Dusty webinar earlier today that the, the, the Binax now might be an option that some that, that could be integrated into that as well. So. Okay, yeah, great. So, Thank you. Yeah, she's referencing the antigen mm -hmm. test, which we have, our public health officials have steered us pretty clear of antigen at the moment. So okay. I think we'll stay the course on the PCR. Yeah, I think stay with, I think stay with what you have. Yeah. They're serving us well so far. I have a question. If, if you ostensibly, like me, have three children that end up in three disparate pools and now child one is in a pool that comes back positive, are my are the other two children or the other or any other siblings impacted by that? So I mean, ostensibly, like just because you're in a pool with someone doesn't mean that they're a, a close contact per se. So how does that sort of that logistical? Yep, we talked like, that through earlier today. I don't. We would not impact the siblings because you're right. There's no connection probably to the yeah. positive case unless they are the positive case. So it, we would just want to be efficient to identify who the positive is just frame of reference and this was really interesting i we we talked with wellesley earlier today who started doing their surveillance testing way back um earlier in the fall they've had 28 positive cases come out of the asymptomatic testing so that isn't overwhelming to me that sounds quite manageable um you know i think one of my fears was oh my goodness how are we going to find these big huge numbers of asymptomatic cases it doesn't sound like it, despite even where we are with the surge, what it will do is identify them. Um, and I think that's just, that's helpful to everybody, right? Community, schools, everybody. Yeah, if, if I could, I, I have a comment and maybe a question. Um, and if you'll allow me a moment to introduce and credentialize myself, I'm Chris Park, I'm a Concord parent. I have three children in Concord Public Schools today. I also, in my day job, um, serve in the management consultant field in healthcare research and diagnostics. And I've spent the better part of this past year supporting efforts to scale uh, diagnostic testing around the country, including most recently and directly with the Rockefeller Foundation and the publication of their national testing plans. And now even more recently than that, alignment with some of the new um, appointees of the Biden administration on developing a national testing plan. Um, the, the, the comment I'll make is I'm happy to act as a resource because there are some very interesting and important federal direction coming that I think will be net positive to everything that's been talked about on this call relative to testing and funding and protocols and research and expectations and so on and so forth. And I certainly don't want to take time on this call to do that, but certainly happy to, uh, to act as a resource if it's helpful. 
Uh, I will say from my perspective, having experienced much of what's going on around the country, um, Concord Public Schools in the state of Massachusetts is in a fairly good place relative to many others uh, in terms of the assets that the state has contributed and the point of view, et cetera, et cetera. So as a Concord parent, I feel generally good. The question I have though relates to that. And if I put my parent hat on for a moment, I'm very excited by some of the federal guidance coming out. I'm very excited by what you'll start to hear is the one, two, three testing plan, which is one test per child, two tests per adult per week to essentially create a threefold increase in asymptomatic universal testing. The whole point of that, I think, is very strong push towards in-person learning. And the research that's starting to surface would suggest that actually in-person learning can be safer in many environments and geographies than remote learning where community spread might be more prevalent. And so, Dr. Hunter, when you talked about the Wellesley experience, uh, there weren't a hundred or a thousand new cases identified. There were 28 or so, and it's manageable. Yeah. The idea is to increase substantially the comfort and confidence of in-person learning as the right model. Uh, and so you find me being very optimistic and supportive. My question is this, um, given how appropriate I believe and conservative that Concord has been to date, do you envision a scenario, what are the minimum standards of performance by which we might have 100% in-person learning again before this school year ends? Or are we gonna kind of continue on the path we're on with partially or hybrid solution for the balance of this year and then reassess over the summer? So uh, Mr. Park, I'm gonna ask you to uh, share your address with us. Sure, uh, 215 Lexington Road in Concord. All right, uh, Dr. Hunter, uh, I'm gonna ask you uh, to follow up on that, but uh, not tonight. I think it's a big question, an important one. I'd like uh, Mr. Park to give you his contact information offline. Uh, you uh, can't escape us, you're lhunter at concordps.org. Oh, I, I assure you everyone has it right now. <laughs> <laughs> There is no quick answer to that question, right? We need to, that's gonna be a committee discussion as different things start to evolve. So. Uh, thank, thank you for introducing it, Mr. Park. Um, so uh, I wanna bring us back. Uh, this can't be shortchanged, but we also have to uh, watch, watch the time. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, we do not meet next week, uh, and so we need to uh, decide as a committee what we can decide and determine tonight uh, by way of uh, advice and direction for Dr. Hunter and uh, what can safely wait two weeks. Um, uh, the, the easy one, I believe, is that uh, you submit the DESI app by this Friday, otherwise you foreclose that option for Concord and Concord Carlisle. So that's, uh, that's a necessary. Um, and in terms of how fast we move on other uh, potential options available to us uh, with, I think, some agreement about the, the hoped for benefits of any move, moves we make, uh, it strikes me that some, some of that a timing decision is based on our confidence in the state coming through by end of month. Would, you, would I be correct? That's what we've been told. I think I'll leave it at that because I haven't heard any follow up. Brad, did you hear more today? I mean, they're saying February 1. Um, yeah. I know they have some work to do. Yeah. Um, but I think everyone's, I mean, I think everyone's pushing. Yeah. And I, I do think the way this rolled out last week says they're, they must be pretty queued up to keep it moving because it was such an aggressive rollout. So, um, so whether it's exactly February 1 or a little bit in, but I, I think they're gonna stay tight to their timelines. So are we prepared? I believe then the question is, uh, is this school district prepared to maintain the current level of, of effort testing uh, for two and a half weeks? Uh, to be picked up then by the state in an expanded effort, uh, giving us time to decide, do we continue at that level of testing independently uh, with CIC likely after that? Am I framing it the way you all understand it? Would you clarify if it's teachers or teachers and students, please? Right now we are, teach we are testing uh, symptomatic uh, at the high school in Cambridge. And some asymptomatic if people go in and pay for themselves. Correct. Yeah, we, 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 have... we become a vehicle to 
some access, but yeah. Right, we, we're, we're saying you don't have to go to stop the spread, you can go to Cambridge. Right. So that's what's in play today. And what I'm asking is, uh, uh, can we move faster? Is it realistic? And I'm hearing one, that the state's coming in in two and a half weeks. And number two, uh, Brad's firm would take uh, something approaching two weeks to introduce anything anyway, if I'm correct. Yeah, but I would, I, I think if the state's February 1st, that probably means February 1st plus two weeks to stand up to, you know, so it doesn't mean you're, it's not go, you know, it's not, okay. that's not a go date, right? You know, I, 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 at least that's my interpretation. Yeah. I think right. that's fair. Course, we perhaps look at trying to move forward with testing the um, staff. And if we get a window where we can start that before the state testing, I think it would be helpful to just introduce the district to the process um, before we begin testing everyone, it sounds like. Uh, so I really think it would be helpful just to do a staff only test. Or if, it would be voluntary for staff, right? Absolutely. It's, we cannot, yes. we're not a private school. Oh, okay. We can't require okay. anybody to get tested. We can so, ask. Uh, so start date would conceivably be as soon as CIC can uh, pull it off and end date would be whenever the state says we usher CIC out for six weeks with the uh, intention we of bringing them right back in again. We is, don't know, right? Is that correct? Yeah, with the once, once a week uh, rotation. Correct. Okay. So, <laughs> I have a question about, is there any advantage to, to breaking up? If, so if we test the staff, but, um, and, but just once a week, is there any advantage to doing half on one day and half on another day? I mean, does it give us any better kind of picture or is it, I mean, it's, I know you don't know where the-, the No, no, I mean, there's, there's some logic to that. There's some logic. I mean, I think, um, um, with the individual testing that you know that organizations do, a lot of times they'll divide up their community to you know one fifth each day. You know, that kind of gets that's kind of is a little bit better. So, okay. yeah, I think if, if you if you wanted to do if you wanted to spread it out into two or three different days, that there's that that would be I think net positive. So just to be clear, Lori, in terms of what you need from us, we don't have a vote on. You don't need an actual vote, right? But you need us to be supportive of this so that you can move forward and execute. Right. Okay. And the scope yeah. of what you're supporting, I think just to clarify it, it you know, and my, I'm gonna take what court started, I think, and say, I think if we were to spend the next two weeks working with CIC to ramp up staff testing, it would keep us ahead of, it would keep us, it would get us moving if we don't come back. And this is your decision. I'm just offering an opinion if we wait till two weeks for you to revisit that and see where the state is, you know, we just lose two weeks at a time is this. We don't really lose it anyway, because then, I mean, we're, we're ready when the state ends. Yes. Yeah. That work is done, right? Yeah. Like we're ready to pick up on that end. So yeah. If our, if our direction to you was engage with CIC, uh, begin weekly testing as soon as feasible, uh, until state uh, moves in with the expectation that we would resume on our own at a perhaps lesser level when the state stops its twice weekly. Um, we're in fact then asking you to engage on many fronts. One is CIC, one is internally with the district and the employee groups uh, and the personnel and another one is with the Ed Fund and another one is coordination with uh, public health in town and uh, the, the uh, vaccination site. Uh, you're working on a number of fronts. If we yep. say move with CIC for the purpose of weekly testing for staff and faculty ASAP. Correct. I'm in favor of what you just said. Having, having this opportunity uh, so clear puts the responsibility squarely on our shoulders. Uh, and uh, I would echo what Heather said, this is the right thing to do. 
it's the best. Yeah, thing I, to do. Yep. I think that was the state's intent, you know, as, as Mr. Parks referenced, there's certainly an intention to keep schools, you know, becoming a safe place and perceived as a safe place. And you're right, the state has left all districts with it hard to turn down. Mm -hmm. which is good that we've been craving some state <laughs> state action like yeah. this leadership <laughs> yeah. so it means it means dr hunter is going to ask your firm to be quite flexible because uh, and it might you might be uh, fortunate in that regard uh, given the fact that you may have affiliations with the state that are independent of affiliations with us that's your business um but you will need to be flexible on our behalf and we appreciate that yeah, we'll sort it. I, I imagine as we start a discussion, we'll know there'll be more information over in the coming days. So we'll, we'll, we'll work together to make something that's pragmatic. Okay. I'd like to hear from the other members. I know Sarah would as well. A go quick or no go? Yes, thank you. Uh, court, just a quick, quick clarification. We don't have to vote on uh, the payment for that two weeks to test uh, teachers, right? That that's. Dr. Hunter has the authority to uh, allocate. Okay, great. She wants our guidance. But what about the 18 weeks? Like you even have the authority to spend that 127K if it didn't, it's in fact that. So we, we, have have time, we have time to come back to that. Okay. Yes. So we're really talking about the two weeks and then the state's six weeks ish. And the likelihood that we would re engage with CIC, and we, we're not imagining anything else at this point, but we don't have uh, uh, anything other than. Lori's uh, first first cut at costs. And for the six weeks with the state, are we still keeping with staff only, or would that be a larger effort? Whatever they offer up. And I think we heard that the community needs to know 75% participation gets us something meaningful. So meaning if we didn't get in a survey an indicator that 75% of families were interested we wouldn't do it? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it would be unfortunate because we'd like to get the highest yield we can if our goal is in fact a, a healthy community and a, uh, a school operation that's uh, no less than what we have now. And then I think the nice thing about the state testing is that it gives the members of the community an opportunity to see how it operates. As Cynthia said, how easy it is, right? And, and hopefully we have similar results as to Wellesley, that it's not, it's catching what needs to be caught, but there isn't, it's not that everybody's being nice, you know, told they have to stay home. Um, so it, it will hopefully, you know, it'll, it, it'll be perceived as less impactful um, as people who might be hesitant to participate. With, with I have a quick question too. Does the state's cost in this six week program cover the follow-up PCR tests from the pool testing, or that would be on no. the families and, no. yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, the state's, the state's encouraging to use these by next tests because I think they have a bunch of them. Okay, but we wouldn't use this. Right. I, I um, uh, just wanted to say, uh, um, I, I, I am in agreement with Dr. Uh, uh, Hunter to, to bring this pr program. I can only see that some students might uh, be not willing to test particular day if they have to work and they don't want to miss a uh, day of work because you can't, you know, if you're on a poll, you can't go to work. But um, it's definitely um, for the. Alexa, opinion? I, I, my only thought is with families, with respect to 75%, if, if we can't fund it, which that's the big nut, right? That's like the almost 600,000. I, I think the barrier to entry could be cost where you have, you know, family of three at $120 month, dollars a month baseline, any positive test, you got 80 bucks a test at two, you know, for a total of 240, you're talking about $360 for the month. I think that's the only concern I have is cost being a barrier to entry for families if they're asked to self-fund. My second uh -huh. request, oh, sorry, quick. No, go ahead, Lauren. My second request tonight is to survey families so we start to get some information because um, I think that's important to know what target we're aiming for for dollars and 
uh, you know, connecting that with CEF, connecting that with fundraising, looking at our CARES money. I think we, we need that point even now to better understand what the total cost would be. Yeah. But we're not deciding that tonight. We don't, right. Yeah, we don't need to. That's the gift of the state money. We got this little buffer time window to work with that we just didn't have before. Fatima, would you weigh in? Yes, I would be in support of uh, moving forward. Um, and I do have the same concern as um, Alexa uh, discussed. And so the survey is going to be important. And we do have the fail safe of making clear to Dr. Hunter that we need uh, uh, financing uh, examined and discussed uh, for the post state portion of, of anything on this. I assume this is an ongoing discussion that we revisit no. regularly while we make our way through the stages of it. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, Sarah and I, on behalf of the committee, will now say to you, uh, Dr. Hunter, do you have what you need? I think I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, we want to thank the folks from CIC. We're going to see you again. Uh, thank you so very, very much for reaching out to Lori. Uh, it's been invaluable to us. So, so we, uh, we are very appreciative. You, you and I know we've got a long way to go here. And uh, uh, this, is, this is tough stuff. But thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the discussion. Have a good night. Yeah, bye-bye. So, um, we still have quite a bit of an agenda to go. I might propose, if people are amenable, to a five-minute break. Um, so moved. <laughs> see, you, see you all at uh, 728. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you for the break. <laughs>
So, Laurie, thank you for setting that up. I thought that was uh, very, very useful. You're very welcome, and I'm just grateful for their initiative. Yeah. I noticed that Salem uh, is is uh, doing a lot to uh, offer up their experience to other districts also around oh, testing. Okay. They seem to be out in front as well. Right. Okay, good to know that. We will consult with anyone who wants to yeah. advise. Us. <laughs> superintendent, superintendent released a two minute video today on what they're doing. I'll send it along. Okay, super. How many well, of us were at FinCom last week, last Thursday? So, so. Yeah, some something more than half of us have seen the presentation. Okay. So that means we're gonna go easy on you, Jared. <laughs> I'm ready. We're not gonna go easy on you, Ian. <laughs> I'm ready too. <laughs> we haven't harassed Jared in a while. I see we night. <laughs> All right, are we at full strength? Yes. All right, so we never actually uh, formally recessed, so we will declare that we are underway again with our agenda. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. 
So with that, uh, we're on item eight, uh, and that is the uh, regional uh, FY22 report with uh, uh, Mr. Stanton and Mr. Raines. Great. Okay, so uh, a lot of this information uh, you've seen before. Uh, there's not many new updates from my December report, my October report, and my July report. Um, so some of the things that I'm going to be talking about um, is you know rebuilding the budget um, in a way where uh, we're rebuilding the school system. And next year is sort of a bridge year. And Laurie's going to talk a little bit on that when we get to that slide. Then I'll give you an update on the budget timeline. Uh, some dates have changed uh, a teeny little bit. Uh, Year-end expenditures in both the general fund as well as our grants revolving gift accounts. You've already seen these. Uh, uh, updated external revenue um, amounts, um, governor's budget impact, the FTE uh, budgeted amount, which you have seen before, just an update on collective bargaining, OPEB, uh, EMD, special education, health insurance, um, a little bit about the CARES Act. I'm going to be going into that in a, um, a little bit later in another presentation or actually conversation, I should say and then um, the financial impact of the enrollment shift in the high school. So I'm gonna throw this slide over to Dr. Hunter right now. And I'm gonna stay at a very high level. I think we actually just touched on some of what this slide is, is intending to communicate. And you're gonna hear a lot more of it as we bring you the budgets. Um, just the, you're aware, there's a lot of unknowns here. We're gonna to have to take some, some projected you know, I hate to use the word guesses because I think it's better than guess, but it's not sure thing. So somewhere in there. And really, I think what we're going to end up bringing you is a budget with the most options possible in it and then continue to narrow down as we get closer to June um, with Concord Town meeting being in June. So I just I think it's important to just frame that we're probably going to come in on the you know wider ranging set of options, some and by options I mean somewhere between where we are now in terms of hybrid and um, not having kids in full time, all the way to how do we get kids back in full time, and some of that yes does depend on what this year turns out to be, and that's a conversation we just sort of touched on and pulled back from, but I think to assume that we're all back full time normally. We can't do that, certainly in January, we can't do that for September. Maybe as the months go by, we'll be able to get more and more sure of that. Maybe we're gonna be more sure of how a whole number of variables start to play out with vaccines and such. So more just the framing of, we're gonna to need to think broader scale and then hone in as we go. So really that will mean the budgets we bring you initially, we're not really expecting to be the final landing space for the budget. I think in March, you're going to have to vote a number. That's our best, best number at the moment, knowing we're going to have to keep revisiting it. And if, you know, those of you who heard me say that to the finance committee that, you know, we're not going to be able to put in a warrant and be done with these budgets. And it served us really well last summer, right, to stay at it right up till the latest hour we could. And we built really solid budgets that have us set up in a good place. And we just want to be sure we do that again, rather than you know, the, the fewer unknowns we can, you know, remove from the budget as time goes on, the better. So all yours, Jared. Great. So just an update on the budget timeline. So believe it or not, tomorrow is our first um, meeting with the elementary principals. Um, so the week of the 22nd, though, we're having the middle school and the high school meetings, and we hope to wrap up all the meetings by that Friday, the 25th. Um, I'm sorry, Friday the 29th. Um, and then uh, that weekend, I get to uh, put all those numbers together and uh, some sort of presentation to you of where we're at on February 2nd. Originally, that was a week later. We moved it up so we can go to the FinCom on the 4th and present that same information. Again, we may not have a number yet, but we'll have a lot of budget drivers um, and uh, a lot more information than we have right now. February 23rd, we hope to have a recommended budget. As Dr. Hunter just, just said, that number uh, will be our highest number probably. And then we're gonna have to uh, keep getting that down. Warrants are due on the 19th. So the school committee will need to have a, um, a, a budget voted before that time. Um, 
the and then April, May, and June, uh, we will continue to update that budget up until town meeting, which is scheduled in Concord on the 13th. And I'm still waiting on a, a date for Carlisle. This is a report that you have seen before. This is how we ended. Uh, we ended with just over 67,000 or almost 68,000 in surplus. This number went to E and D. There were a lot of adjustments throughout the year just because of the year that we had. Um, so, um, so we ended, we ended, we ended with the surplus, which is a good thing. This is the same exact report that you have seen before by the 100 function. Um, and it just goes a little deeper into those numbers. Uh, this is how we ended our revolving gift and other balances. Uh, you've seen this. We're in a really good uh, spot, especially when it comes to circuit breaker. Um, we're at the max there. And then some high balances in the athletic revolving as well as the school launch revolving account. In the school launch in particular, we did charge funds to the general fund to get that balance as high as possible. Uh, four to six months worth of expenses because we anticipated at the time, we didn't know what to anticipate for FY21. We are starting to um, run some numbers this year and get closer to closer, uh, closer to a break even point, which is what we're trying to do with, uh, we do not have a full staff uh, at both CPS and the high school. We have um, reduced some so uh, we anticipate to carry a healthy balance into FY22. And then some other uh, high accounts, there is the OPEB, which I'll go in on another slide. Uh, and again, the athletics revolving account. Here is the updated um, external revenue projection. The only thing that was adjusted here is the chapter 70 money. Um, the governor's budget reduced the, the amount that they initially had by, I want to say it was 67,000. Um, I'm sorry, 53,000. Um, 67,000. Uh, but the good thing is, is we're still higher than the 550 that we used uh, as a budget offset. Here it is, the governor's budget. The only impact here on the uh, revenue side, again, was the, um, was the chapter 71. And um, down here with the assessments, so assessments are uh, in our general fund. Those were adjusted. Um, here's the budgeted assessment. The governor's new budget decreased the school sending choice as well as the charter school significantly. Uh, kids aged out kids have, must have, uh, they left. So we are looking at uh, about an $83,000 surplus in the general fund that can offset other uh, expenditures that may go in the red. Here are our budgeted FTEs. Um, there has certainly been some additions and subtractions in, um, in, in some areas, um, but we budgeted about 208 that does not include our transportation drivers amount. That's about 20, 15 to 20 FTEs. Um, we will have some sort of uh, formula to show them in the FY22 budget. Um, we have some, um, what we're calling uh, student supervisors. Those were the, the drivers of the FTEs in FY21, but those are being charged to the CARES Act. And um, we're still in discussions as to if those will continue in FY22. Collective bargaining, um, here are the six units um, that are uh, impacted on the region side. Uh, three of these six are, uh, are joint. Um, so five of the six we are going to be negotiating with. The tutors are up next year. And here's our uh, OPEB. Um, and you saw that our, our balance uh, was over five, uh, $5 million, which is, uh, I keep saying, which is one of the highest of any region in the state. Um, 
and that uh, is very good news, especially for my future self in 20 years when it's paid off. So it, it's going to do the towns very, very good. And I think fiscal watchdogs are very heartened by this as well. Uh, e and D. Uh, so the good news right now about E and D, uh, what we anticipated uh, is that we're going to have a max E and D um, has not been certified yet, but here's our estimation of 4.99%. Um, it's, it's just it's such a good position to be in with the unknowns of the next couple of years. Um, so that's that's just really really good news. Um, special education, uh, here are the tuition expenditures. Um, as you can see, we are at a three-year low. Um, we are, we've done many things in-house to keep students in-house uh, at both the, um, at the CPS side, so that's feeding up into the high school, creating a number of uh, programs, um, and they've just done such a, such a great job over in that department. Um, I wanna say right now we have about 28 out of district students. And just three years ago, um, it could have been almost double that amount. And here are our health insurance numbers. Um, I do wanna read a little bit about what I wrote about health insurance. Um, so, Right now, the, the, the full impact of COVID-19 on the health insurance rates is still unknown. Um, the decrease in elective procedures will likely limit the FY22 rate increases, which will help the FY22 budget. We should know a little bit more in the next two weeks. Um, the initiative programs to encourage low-cost health saving accounts has limited the growth cost in recent years. Um, so right now, we're in pretty good position uh, in our health insurance, um, especially since we carry this cost in the region's budget. The CARES Act, and I'm gonna go into this uh, a little bit more. Um, so right now, the we're anticipated at the region to receive approximately 423,000. The 297,000 uh, is the initial CARES Act amount. The, uh, this 26,263 is the uh, emergency relief amount. So that's based on the Title I. New news has come out uh, in the past week or so about um, giving additional relief. We're hearing it's gonna be about 3.7 to 3.8 times the, this amount right here. Um, the information that I had to the FinCom um, was it was based on this 297,000. Uh, although DESE and the state have not come out with the exact numbers yet, uh, I do believe it's going to be based off of this 26,000. Uh, but you know, an additional 100,000 will be great. Um, we are able now to carry this money. Uh, originally, right before the holiday break, we thought we had to expend the $297,000 by December 30th, 2020. They extended that a year. And then um, this $26,000, as well as this potential $99,000, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to carry that into uh, maybe even FY22, FY, uh, FY23. And I think they, they'll, um, it won't be as um, stringent on what we need to use that money on. So hopefully new information will come out in the next couple of weeks. So uh, as I said at the, at the FinCom meeting, and you've seen, this, you've seen this slide before, but if there's one takeaway I would like everyone to come away with, uh, it's this slide right here. And I'll certainly have more illustrations as we get into the budget development and present, uh, presenting that. Uh, but it's, it's important to understand the impact increases and decreases on assessments between October 2018 and October 2019. 
Concord gained 17 students and Carlisle lost eight. Total enrollment percentages went from 75.25 in Concord and 74.75 in Carlisle to 76.1% in Concord and 23.9 in Carlisle. This 8.5% swing resulted in an assessment increase to Concord of $272,938 in FY21. Further, as projected, the October 1 enrollment continued with 38 more Concord students and another eight less in Carlisle. This will result in another 1.22% assessment swing and an assessment impact of $426,646 to Concord in FY22. And there'll be more information on that uh, on the second. So any questions on the region's budget? I, I appreciate uh, seeing it and hearing it uh, a second time. Uh, regrettable about the uh, CARES money uh, being Title I uh, related, not uh, original grant related, but so be it. Um, uh, the, the enrollment shift uh, has produced again uh, the sentiment on the part of certain members of the FinCom that we should look at the regional agreement uh, to dampen the one-year shifts, uh, but that's a big conversation for another agenda item, but I wanted to note that we did hear that again last week, no surprise. I think it's all quite clear, Jared. Any comments, questions? This is Sarah's meeting to chair. Forgive me, I shouldn't be speaking. No, I think it's just important that we circulate that timeline well, you know, that everybody kind of keeps that that timeline in mind um, because it's it's a tight timeline. It's mm. a lot happening um, in the next couple of weeks. One thing I did not have on that timeline is uh, Dr. Hunter and I will be going to the Carlisle FinCom on January 27th. We are on the agenda at 745 and I'll probably be giving this presentation over again. We might be going a little earlier. I didn't get confirmation of that, but. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I'll confirm, uh, it should be 715. Yeah, I think it might be 715 here. So that'll be good. All the committees will be synced up to the same place in the process and we'll just continue to make that the practice that, and you will get the information first going forward now that we've got the meetings ordered the right way, which is the way it should be. And as uh, our participant talked about earlier in our testing discussion, there's been a lot of uh, information coming out of that Rockefeller report that um, there will be a significant, uh, significant higher investment from the federal government in helping schools. Uh, so um, and that's another moving thing, and we don't we don't really know what the uh, you know the Senate and House set up that that might be more likely than it was a couple of weeks ago. So I'll we'll just have to watch and see what happens. Any other comments? Questions? Uh, just a quick comment uh, uh, to what uh, Dr. Hunter mentioned that uh, there are just so many unknowns at this point uh, of what our costs are going to look like and our budget is going to, um, what, uh, how our budget is going to be driven by the COVID response because we don't know where we're going to find ourselves come September. So um, it's not going to be an easy discussion. Um, hopefully there will be more funding coming our way. And we just need to have a lot of patience. And uh, even when it comes to those dates that we just uh, looked at together. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'll also comment, I can do it later regarding both committees, but since everyone's here, I also felt like, I guess I, I want to appreciate the finance committee and their response to all of this the other night, because in presenting all of this uncertainty, I felt like they were very under, not only understanding, but supportive of the fact that this is how we're doing it because we want to try to get the best information. And so uh, I just wanted to appreciate the supportive back and forth there. 
Yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Ian. Um, I think we can go to politics now. I'm happy to open this up if you'd like. Thank you. Okay. So really the policy subcommittee met um, and these are two of the policies that we looked at. Uh, you will recognize them because they've been on your agenda previously. Uh, what we did, you'll recall they came forward and we needed to connect with the attorney, which we did. And then the policy subcommittee reviewed that, those recommendations. So the student discipline one, um, we're actually bringing it back to you with a recommendation of leaving it as is. There had been a suggestion from a year ago to work through some language changes, su some suggested language changes. When the attorney saw them, she suggested we should not go forward with that. It was a little bit of um, softening of the ex ex expulsion, but it's not really expulsion anymore because we owe kids 20, 90 days of service and there's nothing longer than 90 days. But so it was related to, we had suggested language a year ago, the attorneys now looked at it, recommended to the policy subcommittee that it stay the same. And now we're just bringing it back to you for closure that the committee, unless you have something you want us to pursue, should, uh, should elect to leave that student discipline policy as is, it's in good shape. Um, the bullying prevention policy, we had uh, a year ago made some suggested language changes to the definition of cyberbullying. We brought that to the attorney. Her recommendation was to go to the legal definition in mass general law, which is what now is in included in the, in the draft you have. So that would be the recommendation is to utilize the, the legal definition of cyberbullying. Um, and so that would come back to you for a second reading we can bring the other one back for a formal vote to leave it as is um, in two weeks. And you're welcome to let me know if you have questions. We have a number of others in the pipeline, but these were the ones that were um, ready to roll. <laughs> so I think uh, in two weeks time, we'll have a recommendation coming from our subcommittee members, if I'm correct, uh, for adoption. Well, I th tonight I'm bringing you the recommendation on their behalf. They're welcome to speak up at okay. any point here on our discussion. Got it. If I may speak, um, uh, I really appreciate that um, subcommittee meeting on the policy. Um, as we were going through uh, the policies, it was uh, really helpful to have Dr. Hunter um, uh, ex explain how the policies uh, work in practice. Uh, and then uh, listen to the recommendations that were coming from the attorneys. So um, understanding both sides, what happens and how the school, um, uh, how the school uh, works through uh, those situations uh, gave better understanding and a lot more comfort with the uh, verbiage that is in the in Massachusetts law. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the policy committee and we look forward to hearing the outcome of January 20th's uh, meeting too. So then we will vote on the recommendation. You, you, we vote next at the next meeting on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Um, so back to Jared with some old business now. With the CARES Fund update. Yes. Do you want me to put the memo up? Does that make sense? That would be great. All right. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. All right. Uh, let's get it back up. So I provided this memo uh, to you last. Oh, 
last week, um, based on what has been expended to date, and this is for both districts. Um, and at, to date, we've uh, we've expended one million two hundred forty-eight thousand nine hundred fifteen dollars, um, and that is uh, here is the different expense categories. So um, building alter, uh, alterations, which down below it includes the signage, plexiglass, tents, scrubbers, air filters, um, um, a bunch of the sneeze guards, etc. cetera. Uh, then the cleaning supplies, uh, contracted services, um, the curriculum supplies, any PPE, um, and then uh, the remote learning hardware, um, uh, payroll, uh, which was just the um, student supervisors and um, long-term subs. So we have all of the backup behind this. Uh, if you wanted to see that, it's a number of lines. So we will be audited. Um, and so we have to keep, you know, record of, you know, when it was expended, uh, when it was ordered, what school, PO numbers, everything. Um, so uh, happy to answer any questions on this. Um, and we also, uh, Ian Rames did a nice little pie chart right here. I think the, the, the town did uh, something very similar. Um, so the good thing, again, the good thing is because they announced that we can carry that money over, um, we have expended quite a bit, but at least we can now take the available balances and at the end of the year, we can thoughtfully think, do we wanna carry that into the next year? Do we wanna offset the FY22 budget with it? Um, maybe we can bring it over to uh, FY23 um, et cetera. So uh, it allows us to really, really plan ahead. So happy to answer any questions on this. Happy to send you all of the backup um, if that's something you want to take a look at. Uh, but I do assure you that uh, Ian Rames is, is um, managing this money uh, very, very well. And um, and every, ex every expenditure that we have uh, will meet the criteria of what the grant was approved for. Jared, I'll, I'll say it. In hands other than yours and Ian Rames, uh, I might be quite worried about the haste with which we had to close out the year, but I don't think that happened here. I think that uh, uh, you and your, your team at Ripley were, were very careful and thoughtful about this from everything I can see. Um, and I, I thank you for, for the care you took, even though you had that time pressure looming over your head for until the 11th hour. Um, when you refer to one-time costs, are you largely referring to building alterations? Uh, yes, let me see. Um, that was my that was my assumption. You referenced no. one-time costs in your first paragraph, and so I was guessing these were fixed purchases, not to be repeated. Yeah, I can I can answer that one right off the top of my head. So those are, those are things like the plexiglass barriers that we had installed, um, all the HVAC upgrades that we did at the middle schools. Um, it's mostly HVAC and uh, the plexiglass barriers. So that's the vast majority of it. As we hope. Good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? Many thanks, Ian and Jared. Um, I think we can move on to action items. Yeah. Yeah. We have three votes tonight. First, um, we have a motion for the vote to approve staff requests to enroll children. Should we pull those up to the screen? Sure. I, 
Well, I'm happy to make a motion. Oops, there we go. Okay. Uh, while you do that, I will, oh, whoops, I jumped around. There we go, now I can see it again. I will move that they, oh, no, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm gonna not to get my hands off the keyboard while you're reading. <laughs> <laughs> I will move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the following staff requests to enroll their children in Concord Public Schools or Concord Carlisle Regional School District for the 2021-2022 school year and that tuition be waived. Lindsay Donahue, speech language pathologist at CIPS, daughter to enroll in kindergarten at Willard. Marcelo Pixley, teacher at Carlisle Public Schools, son to enroll in ninth grade at CCHS. Jennifer Rowland, teacher at Carlisle Public Schools, daughter to enroll in ninth grade at CCHS. Danette Siddell, principal Carlisle Public Schools, daughter to enroll in ninth grade at CCHS. And Lena Smith, teacher at CCHS, daughter to enroll in kindergarten at Willard. Second. Discussion. Uh, I want to note that uh, we are not only accepting these students for the next uh, school year, but uh, these will be children will be members of the school community for the school community, excuse me, for the duration of the uh, of the employment of the of the parent or guardian. Roll call vote. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Out aye for both. Ms. Scott, aye for both. Mostafi, aye for region. Brittany, aye for both. And Wilson, aye for region. Thank you. Uh, our second vote is the vote to accept a donation from the Robbins House. We. I might offer just a little background on this. This was actually a grant that the Robbins House uh, posted for application and uh, we applied primarily uh, CCHS staff. This is some of what is funding our anti-racist work through the charge group that you've heard about. And um, the Robbins House awarded the grant to us to fund that. So it's been a real positive. Great. I will move that the Concord Carlisle School Committee's vote to accept a donation from the Robbins House Inc. in the sum of $9,340. Second. Session. Much appreciation. It's important work. Yes. <laughs> and the Robbins House uh, that is on the property uh, uh, near the uh, North Bridge is an exceptional educational resource. And uh, if community members have not uh, visited it uh, once or many times, uh, they've, they've missed something and we look forward to them getting open again and uh, ser serving uh, their, their mission, which they do so well. Roll call vote. Anderson, aye for both. Booth, aye for both. Aye for both. Praise God, aye for both. Mustafi, I for region, and big thank you. Rainy, I for both. Wilson, I for region. Our last vote of the evening is the vote to accept a donation from Leaders Environmental. I'll keep the consistency here. I'll move the Concord Carlisle School Committee votes to accept a donation from Leaders Environmental Inc. in the amount of $125. Second. Uh, discussion? Yeah, I'll just offer this is a vendor that we work with who's just giving back and we're grateful. Very grateful. Great. Uh, roll call vote. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Out, I for both. Ms. Doug, great, gratefully, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Thank you. Ready, I for both. Wilson, I for region. Thank you. And with that, I think I can call to an end the uh, Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee portion of the evening um, and leave our Concord colleagues now if uh, we can have a motion. motion. I will move that the Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee adjourn. Second. Anderson, I for both. Booth I. About I. Ms. Dad I. Mustafi I for region.
Okay, just clarity, it's not both, it's just the region. <laughs> Rainy, I. Wilson, I. We try. Yeah, <laughs> almost. <laughs> try, like the only two of them. That through there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah and Eva, you can all go and gloat and have enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Okay, so the Concord School Committee uh, remains in session. Uh, our item is uh, item 12, and it's the CMS education plan. Um, this is a document that uh, uh, informs the design team, the OPM, and the town at large as to the uh, educational needs of the middle school now and predicted for the future, such that uh, the uh, the design team and the project manager can proceed with uh, the feasibility phase, move into the schematic phase, uh, and produce uh, a design and continue with cost estimating. Um, the education plan uh, has uh, seen a good bit of work of late. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Hunter and uh, the, the entire team that contributed to it. Um, and I want to uh, uh, sh uh, give you my, uh, my, my praise for the, the clarity of the teaming philosophy and the teaming approach that uh, is central to the middle school and how it uh, was uh, conveyed in words in this document. Um, uh, I've got a number of highlights from the document that uh, if we had lots of time, I'd like to share. Um, the uh, question I think before us, uh, given the hour is uh, what we uh, want to do with this with the available time um, at some point, uh, we do need an official vote whereby this document becomes an, a, an official document that is then sent over to the town side, specifically the building committee and the partners that we're working with, Hill International, and more importantly for this purpose, uh, uh, SMMA, the design team. Um, my original thinking as to process would be to ask each of us to uh, take uh, a, a careful two or three minutes and weigh in on uh, what is working particularly well in this document, number one. And number two, are there uh, remaining questions, issues, uh, concerns, or recommendations that would uh, uh, suggest uh, a little more time would be of value? So uh, given the hour, I want to ask you, is that a process uh, that we uh, want to uh, follow at this time? Are you comfortable with that? I don't need a full three minutes. I can probably give a summary of my thoughts in 30 seconds, mm -hmm. but okay. going through quickly is fine with me. Thank you. So why don't we uh, why don't we go through it and uh, be mindful of the time and at the conclusion of one uh, round, uh, we'll check in and uh, see if we want to press ahead with a formal uh, motion tonight or whether uh, we have generated some ideas that would uh, suggest we benefit from a little more time on this. And I will note that. Uh, the design team is not at a standstill uh, by any stretch of the imagination. They're using the draft right now. They're under contract with the town. They're performing beautifully. Uh, and they have hard data from uh, Justin Cameron and, and Lori Hunter as well uh, that, uh, that conforms with the education plan. So we, uh, we want to get this done, but uh, we don't have any uh, a, a critical deadline tonight that's going to impact the project. So with that uh, framing, uh, anybody like to start? Sure, I'll jump in. Thank you, Heather. Um, again, my comments are very quick. What I was looking 
four from last week was mostly that executive summary that kind of pulls out what's really important. Um, in terms of what's working well, I, that made me very happy to see. I think it's great. I think it focuses on um, really the two key themes, which is the teaming and the RTI, RTE. Um, I felt like going through the rest of it, that it was all very comprehensive. Um, and I think mostly to me, I see this as a tool for the design team to design us the building that we need. I know that we're not gonna get everything that's you know, ideal in this document, everything that would be, we would want because that would be too expensive probably, but this so far is being used by the design team and I think very successfully and from what we've heard the, the feedback is good. They find it very useful. Um, and there's been nothing for that, they, that they've asked for in terms of insight and detail. So I actually feel like it's pretty good to go. Good, thank you. Yeah, and echo that sentiment. I think that the executive summary in particular was um, of immeasurable value because it really, it focused the document on what we were trying to achieve. Um, and I think the largest takeaway was the teaming approach and that was addressed sufficiently. Um, I don't really have any other comments other than that. Um, the only thing is I know that there was, there was some questions and I don't know if it's necessary for this document about, you know, what are some things that we will be able to do in this building that we've been limited in the past um, with? Like, are there things that will be enabled by the design. And um, I know I think it was Cynthia maybe that even asked that question if I'm remembering correctly. And that was the only thing that I thought I was sort of looking forward to maybe seeing if there were some answers to. But again, I don't think it, it's at all prohibitive with the, I mean, the document's great. So that was the only question I had. Thank you. Uh... Be happy to go, but I'd uh, uh, be happy to go last as well. So if you pause another few seconds, I'll launch in. So uh, I'll jump in. The only, yeah, the only thing that you know, I'm not a designer, but um, I would think they'd be looking for is proposed program changes um, outside of the two that you were very clear about or you know, the teaming approach, um, but in a more specific way, if there's other proposed changes to RT RTI or RTE, or um, you were looking for different types of spaces than we currently have, that kind of thing. Thank you. So I actually, can I just comment quickly? Cause I actually thought to both of your questions that some of that was flagged through it. At least but, so and, I'm looking for the word proposed and I find it seven times. I'm looking to find it <laughs> many more times than that. Oh, I searched for new and I found it a lot. <laughs> yeah, but that was an it looked more kind of current yeah. and proposed. Yeah. We ended up, and I hear your feedback loud and clear. So we ended up going with <coughs> mostly because of the timing of how quick we are trying to turn this around. There was a nice pattern started with currently dot 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 and in a new building dot 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 so it would have been a much bigger overhaul to go to what you're suggesting and i totally know why you're suggesting it it was more of a time matter that because that pattern had already started we just continued to flesh it out so if you look most i think almost all the sections have you have to read for it i get that part it's not going to jump out at the page at you exactly as if we labeled it a section of you know now and later but I think it's embedded in there. So I, I, we tried to do the best we could with what we heard that feedback within those couple of days time we had to work. So it's a good point. I think we'll keep talking on that and reviewing for that. And let's squeeze in a few words. Um, thank you for the changes. I, I appreciate the changes that were made um, so shortly. Uh, I want to be mindful of uh, the, community's concern um, about the underused space, uh, considering the cost and um, mostly yeah, the cost during this time. So I'm just mindful of that. Um, and I wanted to recognize that's a concern. 
Otherwise, it's fine for me. Well, I'll use your unused time. No, just kidding. Uh, but uh, I, I, I would like to read into the record uh, page 10, maintaining teams where students and educators are not shared or split becomes critical to the effectiveness and benefits outlined in the research. As a result of the team structure, the organization of a new school should promote and highlight this philosophy while noting that space usage is likely to be somewhat lower than that of a junior high school. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the clear declaration here. We're not building a junior high school. We're not trying to achieve that uh, kind of utilization. We're putting the community on notice. Uh, this, this is different and we want them to understand why. Um, uh, the next page, teaching and learning improve because horizontal and vertical professional communication will occur without the barriers of travel or pre-made arrangements, uh, which is uh, uh, language that says we're going to have a lot of uh, communication across educators that is, that is uh, 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 baked into the actual design, mm -hmm. um, not, not insignificant. Um, I do believe that this is 99% uh, ready. Um, I would hope it gets another 1% attention, but I'm going to follow the will of this group uh, tonight uh, or in the future, uh, because I think it's a, a very suitable document, but I think it would benefit from a little more time. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, um, page 15, uh, in our current building space, teachers vie with each other and the musical performing groups for use of the auditorium. I counter that with the uh, fact that we're not making a clear declaration we want an auditorium. So uh, we're kind of uh, uh, uncertain uh, here and, and I understand why, uh, but I, I wonder if a little more time can help us uh, flesh that out. Uh, page 16, I'm confused. Uh, if we have nine teams uh, by design, um, we're being uh, told, and I love the addition of these uh, sections called physical space for English, physical space for science, you know, really uh, uh, makes it clear. But then I find a couple of confusing things, this 1% more attention I'd like it to get. Um, uh, the reference that classrooms should be in close proximity to the library. Well, I'm confused. You can't be close to the library if you're close to your other four, three core subjects. So are we giving uh, a, uh, a direction to the design team that will have them shaking their heads? I would also uh, ask and hope that SMMA and Hill International that see hundreds of these education plans uh, have time to weigh in if they have not done so already. I think that's their job. Um, uh, and just a couple of others, just by way of example, page 25, uh, uh, six or seven world language classrooms, each with a small stage, each with a green screen. Um, and we haven't addressed uh, what's happening with video here, but we have already heard from the community about uh, uh, support for video uh, um, functions. In, in the building. I wonder if we could go a little further there. Uh, final one I'll give you by way of example tonight. Uh, I'll skip adult learning, which I'm curious about those spaces, but uh, page 31 home base, so critical, quote, given the small group size and facilitation by the entire middle school staff, space will be required in a new school to support this daily meeting. If indeed there are groups of 12 students, uh, are we telling the design team we need to host 56 uh, daily meetings? I don't think so, but I, I think we've got a couple of examples of here of how we're so close. Uh, why don't we go from very good to perfect? Yeah, and it, just do you mind a little? No, no, but I don't want to burden you with all this tonight. I don't want you to. No, and, I, and I'm hearing in my head some of these conversations have happened already and probably I have... I'm filling stuff in without realizing it because they know we need space for home base, but they know we don't need 56 small group settings. They know we're going to have to figure it out and get creative. Um, the library, they really wanted that front and center in there because of 
the words that are missing court of the common spaces they want the live we've really suggested the library be as close to the classrooms as possible versus putting the gym next to the classroom right. inside. so it's probably the nuance that i think um i'm happy to take feedback on and keep keep tweaking you know and i let's say loud and clear this this document is bigger than what we can afford. We know what's in there is not affordable. Um, the, the next round of you know, hard choices for the building committee very soon here is these hard choices. Um, SMMA is running the space usage numbers as we speak for that purpose. The design team is strategizing options as we speak for that purpose. We know we can't have everything that's in there. The teachers may not all get their own classroom et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, this is what we've laid out for them to then respond to, and then we'll make our way through it. And, and, and you're not telling us that means you're gonna rein all of these uh, uh, potentials for the future. Uh, you're not gonna wring them out of this document. Um, no, that's the, that's the uh, building committee's job to do. Your job is to make clear, what are we protecting today? What are we potentially enabling for the future? And I think Kristen Olson made a really great point at the end of last week's meeting that what they're gonna do as the design phase evolves and phase finishes is actually respond to how they tried to address the need, maybe not in exactly the same way it was outlined in the document, but at least some dialogue on paper happens back and forth so that the, the items they don't per se do the way maybe it got described in the ed plan at least they acknowledge how they strategized it differently if they've had to go to a different plan. So that that made total sense to me that this would be like the big list. We get through all the, the processing with the committee and then the actual document they write response to what actually happens. So. I think I heard you say that, thank you. I think I heard you say that you and the, the team could benefit, albeit uh, maybe in a small way, but could benefit from uh, a little more time. Uh, but that doesn't uh, prevent this school committee from uh, moving on it tonight. Um, uh, sure. And I think you'd be okay with, with either. I would be okay with either. Was it rushed? It was incredibly rushed. So we mm -hmm. would always benefit from more time. And you know, one thing I've gotten convinced of with this document is this, you could spend a year on this, two years, <laughs> two years on this document um, because of what it is. It's so, so huge and, um, you know, really thorough that you, you could keep going back and back, which I heard loud and clear from the design team. It's meant to be somewhat of a living document that, you know, you keep revisiting as they're designing and, you know, tweaking. And, you know, some of the, the examples you brought up are great reasons why you would go back and clarify or tweak or, <clears throat> something like that so would your uh, team or the members that you'd reach out to uh, be be amenable to uh, a little more time a little more attention a little more refinement uh, of course sure absolutely you know i think we got we worked really hard to get something in your hands in time for this meeting um could we polish it up and you know really fine tune a little bit here and there of course of course. Two weeks, not one, which would be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Which quickly turned into, you know, two days, really, right. yeah. as, as we left here Tuesday night and we're trying to get it to you for Friday, which turned into Saturday. It really whittled it down very quickly. So we divided and conquered and, you know, each pe in some of what you're seeing is the fact that people worked in separate settings and then we pull the document together and you're still, I can hear, I know you're craving the one voice through it and well, that's come a long way in, my opinion. Long way. in yeah. my opinion. That's come Thank a long way. It's yeah. not, uh, it, it has an editor clearly. Uh, yes, no. that, it's come a long way. And we, we did a better job last week of saying, here's a common way we're going to approach this. And you saw some benefit from that. So and the last piece I'll say, we had a lot of feedback um, from your meeting, from, you know, some things that got sent to me, a couple of uh, building committee members. I, don't know that there was a way to take all of it and do every single thing people mentioned because it was a lot and there were a couple of times it was just in, mm -hmm. totally in alignment with each other so if if we missed a real priority for you by all means tell us that um because we did have to make some quick judgment calls without an opportunity for dialogue so by all means if there's a missing major thing 
keep saying so. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to ask you to maybe look at um, is the request to have that second PE space okay. and better define what that is because um, I, I've seen the I'm I will call it a um, that second gym at the high school turned out not to be what the what we thought it was going to be okay. and um, you know should we potentially look at one large gym <laughs> that you could divide into thirds and get a lot more out of it than the second PE space? Or do you really need this smaller space for other reasons? So that's my question. That's one of the things that I think we would uh, be very wise to look into because that's one of the uh, more, more dominant community voices we heard a year ago uh, in regard to that. Our language on page 40 reads, in the new building, quote unquote, we need a third teaching space to accommodate three grade levels. That implies we're teaching three grade levels PE at the same time. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Uh, and we were avoiding uh, the other conversation appropriately so in a sense in that it's uh, largely a community conversation, but if it's gonna be a big community conversation, I think it obligates us to ask you, Dr. Hunter, to what degree could we make uh, educational use out of a different configuration sure. if, okay. if we find we can accommodate, uh, well, that's a stretch, if we can accommodate uh, financially the uh, desires yeah. of that part of the community that we've heard from. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> so uh, if we uh, don't hear a motion tonight that uh, requires a decision on our part, the implication is uh, that uh, uh, we would expect to benefit greatly from a little more time and attention. Uh, and the obligation would be on each of us to make any communications independently to Dr. Hunter that you believe you need to uh, communicate or share or that you think she needs to hear. Yep. Uh, and I think we're obligated to uh, say that should come uh, very, very quickly. Uh, I, I would like to see that come her way by the end of the week if it's the will of the committee to have her go back. Um, let's not make it hard for her. We're making it hard enough. Is I'm excited that I would make two quick comments on that. If we are gonna put it off, I think that's fine as long as we commit to voting on it at our next meeting. I think yes. we should be building yeah. committee that much. Um, and just to your point, Court, I want to repeat um, that even if there are places where maybe it seems unclear because we're saying we want all this, you know, classrooms together, but near the library, I don't want to take out some of those pieces, even if they're contradictory, because to me, it speaks to the goals. So, you know, the, the um, as Laurie said, the designers will look through and say, okay, well, we couldn't do exactly what you said because those two contradict, but here's how we address your goals. So to me, if there's some ambiguity there because things contradict, that's actually okay with me if it expresses the goals that we're trying to achieve. So I, I just wanna make sure we don't pare back the plan because it doesn't seem realistic because uh, we want, still wanna express those goals. Thank you, I think that's really important. Yeah, what looks contradictory, uh, uh, that's one, one term. The other term might be uh, we have competing, competing needs and desires, and that's right. why we need a superb yeah. design team to work with a superb superintendent to, to sort that out. Right. And maybe there's a way to address both of those goals. We just don't right. know what it is because we're not architects. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and I will share with you uh, uh, my commitment, which Dr. Hunter already uh, knows and recognizes, and that is that uh, uh, although uh, we may not act on this tonight, uh, yes, uh, it should be our full expectation to uh, close this chapter at our next meeting. Good. Thank you. Hearing no motion, and I, I thank you uh, for uh, this. I think uh, we're going to be uh, we're very pleased with the result. I think we'll be more pleased uh, next time around with a tiny bit of attention. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, uh, Mr. Stanton and uh, can I, can I just have, have a quick interruption. <laughs> I know Heather said that she would do her liaison report from the building committee, and um, ah, good, good for you. I have okay. some questions about the 
So if, if Heather has a quick report, that would be great. Oh, just over, I actually didn't even mean, I mean, I had a formal report as much as we oh. were gonna talk about it, but um, I guess the, the quick high level report is that we did have our um, second meeting to really re-engage. I would say the first two meetings have really been kind of a, let's figure out where we were and establish the plan going forward. Um, we do have a building committee report that will be going out soon uh, that explains this, but at this past week's meeting, the designers took us through a good high level kind of review of our goals um, for the building committee and what we want to accomplish over the few months, um, the next few months. So from a community perspective, I will let everyone know that we are going to be having some community forums soon, very soon. In fact, we're trying to finalize a date uh, the last week of January um, so that we will announce that as soon as we have the time and date finalized. Um, we'll also be putting out a, uh, not just a building committee update, but kind of a, we're working on kind of a flyer type form that's a, an update after the pause to make sure that we get information out well. And then we're looking at the next community forums uh, being, uh, let's see, February right after the break and April right before the April break. Um, and those are all lined up with the overall process timeline where we can present what we have as information, get feedback from the community, go and rework um, you know, basic plans into site plans uh, and, and take all that feedback, bring it back to the community for, for the next round of feedback, et cetera. Um, so that's the, the general outline. In addition to the open community forums, I know that the design subcommittee led by court is planning on some focus groups as well, specifically to address these big questions like gymnasium and auditorium. Um, we'll talk more about that, but that's our overall high level update. And they could well be woven into these forums that okay. you know, none of that's been planned. That, that planning starts Friday with the design subcommittee. Okay. And then, then we have to uh, coordinate with all the other, uh, or all the other subcommittees. And I, uh, Heather, I happened to read the original charge for the building committee and it did specifically state that the building committee would report to the school committee and to the select board quarterly. Um, that's true. Now, the, we have a select board representative on the building committee. Uh, Matt Johnson is now doing that. So, and actually, it's a good point. We'll make sure he's doing this. But we set up from the beginning that we would regularly update the school committee, which we've been doing much more than once a quarter, and that the select board representative on the school committee would update the select board. Um, so, uh I'll ask that I think very soon we should have a formal update from your building committee chairs to the come to the school committee because honestly I'm still really confused about the status of the project. And I think it would be good once I know once you have um, perhaps your next meeting that they come and sort of give us an update because you've had leadership change on your chair. Yep. Oh, I should have mentioned that on that. Thank you. <laughs> so many, so many moving pieces. Tim Holt, who was a co chair has had to step down for personal reasons. Um, and Pat Nelson, who was our vice chair, has been good enough to step up into the co-chair role. So she was nominated by the building committee and voted in as the second co-chair at this past meeting. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and yes, um, we can certainly look at dates to have the building committee co-chairs come present to the school committee and, and the select board. So we'll thank you for that note and we will Look into do that, do we out. know if there's an open seat on the building committee, or we're not clear yet? We're um, not clear. We're not clear yet okay. um, on that. Uh, one other note uh, to follow up uh, on this, and that is the uh, the co-chairs uh, will be uh, meeting with the FinCom January 21. Uh, FinCom requested it. Hours later, the reply was yes, we'd be delighted to. So. There, there is the readiness to uh, do, do all of this outreach, but uh, uh, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, I, I, that fell off my radar, I'll, I'm guilty, um, so thank you. All right, good point, thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay, so that allowed us to keep Jared around for a few extra minutes, <laughs> but uh, we don't mind waiting, um, and you're a good sport, so thank you. You're on. 
fiscal 22 CPS. And you're on mute, my friend. Jared? Of course I have a visitor. Good timing, always. <laughs> We, yeah, can we, we can recess while you put kids to bed. <laughs> well, I, I am on bed duty, but that's later. <laughs> oh, it's Mia tonight. <laughs> Yay! I, I get to give this presentation up. All right, I will be... Okay. I will be very brief. Um, so sort of the same type of agenda as the region. Uh, I'll give you the uh, end of year expenditures, which you have seen. Um, and usually for the new members, I normally give this report to you all in October, which I did before. Um, so uh, just really quickly, the, the reason we do these reports is the, the, the finance uh, committee from Concord gives a, um, a guideline letter to us every summer. And instead of responding to the guideline in an email, which was a response for many years, we typically, uh, well, the past two years, we've decided to do a fall budget book, and then we present that to the, the finance committee. Obviously, due to the pandemic, we did not do a fall budget book, and this is the presentation that we gave them to try and answer as many questions as possible. I'd like to get back to that fall budget book because um, I give a lot more detail in it. Um, so again, uh, you'll see the end of year expenditures in both the, um, the general fund, uh, the gift accounts, revolving accounts, et cetera, the FTEs that were budgeted, the status of the collective bargaining agreements that impact just the CPS side, special, special education expenditures, the capital plan, and then uh, the CARES Act, which you've already seen. So uh, this was just to recap how the year ended. We were able to um, exhaust the general fund and spend right to zero. Um, there are some, um, certainly some adjustments uh, and just due to the nature of how last year played out. This is the same exact report except by the 100 function. Here is the uh, end of year balances. Uh, we, were able, we were able to max out our circuit breaker. And if you do remember all spring and even the beginning of the summer, I wasn't confident in that, um, but we were able to uh, carry over $808,334, which was the max, um, which is going to set us up for this year and hopefully next year. Uh, that is something that I, I, I want to, um, to, to keep as much in there as possible. Because we are doing so well with our tuitions and keeping students in district, our circuit breaker reimbursement rate is going down. So it won't be as high as the 808. It's gonna be in the 600s most likely, uh, but I do uh, anticipate to, well, it's only January 12th. I, I, my goal is to carry over the max to set us up for FY22. Um, another revolving account that may be jumping off the page here is the food service revolving account. Um, a little bit uh, higher than it was to start the year. We did also charge general fund uh, expenditures for food service to go into the year uh, with a healthy balance. Um, so overall, we're in, we're in really good shape uh, for, for the situation that we're in. The FTEs, again, budgeted. It had, we have had some additions and subtractions, um, mostly in the, in the tutors area. Uh, we did hire some student supervisors and also this budget or this FTE sheet does not include the transportation FTEs. Uh, like I said in the previous uh, presentation, I do anticipate to start to uh, carry those. Collective bargaining, all five units are up on the CPS side. Um, three of them are joint. We are starting our negotiations. Uh, we're on schedule to start on the 19th with the CPS building service workers. Um, 
and then uh, we hope to stay on the collective bargaining schedule to, to make sure that we can have all um, ratified contracts by June 30th. That is the goal. Special ed tuitions, this slide almost speaks for itself. Um, our tuitions are going down. Um, the special ed department, uh, Ruth Gruby and her staff have done a wonderful job creating programs, keeping kids in district. Um, we have um, about 22 students right now that are out of district, which I think I can say quite confidently that was double when I was here uh, in FY18 or 19. Um, and so our tuitions are, are continuing to go down which again will mean the circuit breaker will go down. And then just a recap of the, uh, the capital plan. Um, we anticipate to continue to stay within the town manager's budget of 900,000. This previous year, uh, we requested 830,000. We are starting to um, get the plan ready uh, for the ERU um, energy recovery units for all of you that do not know what that is for uh, get, get it lined up for the spring and, and summer. Um, and we should be in pretty good shape. And then here is just a, a recap of, of the CARES Act. And again, um, this 427 is significantly higher than the um, the, was it a hundred, 112,000, give or take, we are anticipating at the high school. Um, so uh, that is, that's, that's, that's good. Um, we can hope we can use that going into uh, next year or uh, cover the pool testing, et cetera. Uh, this 112,000, uh, we have until this September of 2022 to spend that money. Um, so the goal is right now um, to hopefully be able to leave that until that time uh, and use it to offset or um, the unknown of the FY23 budget. Uh, the town um, gave us uh, an updated number of $126,825. Uh, they needed 273000 for testing. Um, that we were not going to uh, hold back and, and, and not give that money to, back to them. So we ended up um, uh, thankfully receiving that $126,000 from the town. Question, Jared? Couple. Yes. Oh, you knew what I was going to say. Uh, could you go back one slide? Please. Yes. Um, the emergency relief, is this telling us that Title I monies at the high school are more significant than at CPS? Of the way around. So okay. we receive more money, more Title I money at uh, CPS than the high school. Well, that would stand to reason, but that relief two of 427 here, was it, what was it on uh, the? It was- oh, a, I'm, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, it was 99, wasn't it? On give or take, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, I'm sorry. And, Again, this is an estimated amount. I used 3.8 3.8 times the 112. That has, and that's why it's TBD. I'm pretty certain we're gonna, we are gonna get that, and we may get additional money. But again, uh, I, 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 I don't have any additional information uh, as of yet. And as soon as I do, I, I will, I'll report that out. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I needed to double check that. Thank oh. you. So, Jared, I have a question. The, the um, document that you presented during the regional meeting with CARES Act monies divided between CCRSD and CPS. Mm -hmm. So I totaled the Conquer column and the total was 919,003. Let's see. Um... So I don't need it tonight, but there's just between that I'm trying to, if you could give us a breakdown as to what was not funded in the CARES Act money, because obviously there's a lot of things that were not, and where they went, how, how they were funded out of the operating budget, right? Sure. Um, yeah. 
I can do that. And so, and I'll certainly get that. There were, so when that budget, there's been a lot of budget savings, mm -hmm. such as the tutors lines that have funded, such as even um, other lines that have funded um, some things. So I'll be able to figure that out and, 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 and give you that. Um, yeah, there's, said to there's, you, the town also said that they funded the laptop lease for CPS. What was that? Ian, do you want to state that one? Yep, that was the, um, the we, we started a new elementary laptop lease this year. So the first lease payment they picked up in their grant. But so that, what that did is it allowed me to move that money to, to pay other, our long-term subs have been a big driver, a big cost. No, I get um, it. So to, to, to pay off that. Um, the other piece too is these expenses are, they're, straddling fiscal years there's a lot of stuff that we bought last spring so it's it's uh yeah <laughs> but just for the public we did the concord school committee did vote to fund the leases out of the operating budget originally is that correct yeah. yes well yeah. you funded the general fund total amount and they said some of that did get shifted to cares act is that my correct yeah okay. And there are things that certainly were potentially funded in the general fund that are CARES Act eligible that was moved to, to the CARES Act, uh, which would free up things that, that we didn't know about, such as particular softwares or other things. Right. And I know there's more money coming and I'm, I guess I'm just going forward looking at when we kind of return to normal, whenever that is. Um, and what, what it, which of these things might be recurring and then we would have to be yeah. concerned about. That's a good question. You know, additional, future additional expenses that we might need to start thinking that we need to pull back on. You know, we can't have all the, you know, do we need all the remote learning software going forward? Maybe we do, but we just need to justify it. So anyway. Yeah, I think it's worth, do you mind Jared? If I, Please. Uh, I, we're definitely in that mode as we bring you FY 2022. Uh, 22. So Jared and Kristen are working at a really way deep level to gather all the software, look what's duplicated, put a process in place. So we tighten up all of that. Look what's really COVID related versus what's more typical. Mm -hmm. We're trying to really work through all of that. And you're totally right on the recurring funds and CARES Act. I don't know any of you who lived 20, <laughs> 2009, 10, where we all got su subsidy money that bought us a year or two, and then it dried up and we'd all had to use it for recurring funds because there wasn't any other money. Um, you know, you live that the hard way and you really try to avoid it going forward. So even if they've picked up the lease and the town was really generous with us to say they had some funds available in their CARES money. And of course, okay. everything's so prescriptive, we all could only apply things that fit the definition. Um, but that said, we know we have to carry that in the budget going forward because the lease is the lease and we can't not have a budget to support that. So you're, you're very right, is my long way of saying that, Cynthia. <laughs> and one of just the quick things, just because we, so we, we had to identify that amount of money by December 30th. Mm -hmm. Yes, they told us on right before the holiday, but at that time we had a, we did not want to not be able to expend all of it. So that was an eligible cost and that's why we did move that over. Yep, okay. Right, only to then get more time on December 20th. Well, you have like three days to. <laughs> so. Jared, just to, uh, repeat or emphasize the only slide that changed in the last five days was the emergency relief cares numbers correct got it thank you okay and that's it yeah that's it good thank you all right any other questions comments you've got our our gratitude for uh pushing so hard so long today on our behalf and on the district's behalf. Uh, it's a big ask for uh, the school personnel to, to uh, or should I say, suffer through a, a four hour meeting, uh, but you've done so magnificently. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, really important topic. Thanks to your kids for waiting for bedtime. <laughs> 
You couldn't get me out of it? <laughs> okay, that's going the wrong direction. Mr. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can oh. pretend you whatever you want with the door closed. <laughs> Strike that from the record. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, do we have a, a with, with thanks to all uh, for your stamina and all the prep that was necessary to bring this to us, Ian, Jared, and Lori. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second. second. And uh, my request for discussion will be uh, met with silence. Uh, those in favor, please. <laughs> Anderson, aye. Booth, aye. About aye. Ms. said aye. Ready, aye. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. <laughs> Good, and night, family. Good night, Stanton. Good night, Stanton. Bye, Mia.